How was your last gig? That was good. Yeah, really good. It's emotional. It was a little bit, yeah. I got a little um, trophy um, from the guys given to me. I saw that, yes. Quite nice. And yeah, lovely. Yeah, I had, I had um, four, four couples who were there who I'd done weddings for um, over the years, including the, the last wedding I'd done. She was there. The bride from that wedding was there as well, mm. which was nice. Um, family and stuff there. It was, it was it was nice. It was a nice sort of send off. Um, yeah, it, it kind of. I, it wasn't until I got home and un, you know, obviously I got home and unloaded the the car and put all the equipment back in the garage. And I thought, shit, that's it. I'm not going to do it anymore. Uh, live, but, by the way, just you, so, you, you wouldn't say that word, really, would you? No, no. I said, but, oh, no. I said, oh, damn. <laughs> I said, damn. Blast. Blast. I said. Um, yeah, no more preps, no more meets, meet and greets with couples, and no more prep and playlists and all the rest of it. Yeah. But, but, it was nice to, at the weekend, say to uh, one of our friends, yes, I can come to your barbecue in June. Yes, I bet. <laughs> As funny as that sounds, it's, it's something that I've not been able to say for quite a long while. Uh, yes, uh, Captain Crew, something appears to be on fire. I should probably go and investigate to make sure that the house isn't on fire. Is that your beep? Yeah, it is. Yeah, yeah. We've got a smoke oh. alarm going off. Uh, I'll be back in a moment. Hang on. <laughs> mm. Matt will come back with a fire extinguisher. <laughs> We've already had one fire previously there, haven't we? Mm. You seem, I recall correctly. Yeah. Uh, but... Uh, Yes. Well, we've got a very packed show tonight, haven't we? We have we've got a crammed an awful lot in tonight and uh, lots of things to watch and to listen to as well. Let's sort of get everything in this week. Yes, fair enough. Um, it's, really good. it's been quite a, it's been a, quite a nice day today. Never had a, we had some oh, nice it, sunshine here. Oh, well, I'm glad it was for you. I was down in our office in Brighton today and driving back up this afternoon, it absolutely threw it down oh. and even with four very good tires on the st uh, uh. aquaplaning was an issue i have to say yeah uh. good news everyone the house has stopped burning down oh good <laughs> nice <laughs> Excellent. Lovely. Well, at least I've st I've stopped the noise from from going off. I've taken the battery out of the smoke alarm. That's normal procedure, oh, good. right? I normally do. <laughs> yeah. the, the problem with our ones is in here. <clears throat> these are all blooming mains. mains. Yeah, yeah. So to turn them off, I have to flip the switch in the breaker box uh, okay. downstairs. Oh, well, that's fair enough. Yeah. I nearly hit one with a broom handle before, and Gem <laughs> Gemma warned me against that because it was in the newly decorated part of the house. Right, right, yes, yes, indeed, quite right. Absolutely. But they're loud, and because they're linked, they're all circuit linked, so they... So if one goes Ooh. off, they all go off, yeah. Oh, my yeah. God. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What I didn't realise was, when we changed ours, because again, ours are mains operated as well, they actually have a service life of 10 years, mm. Mm. Uh, and then you throw them away. Basically, yes, or yeah, you yeah, send yeah. to your local recycling centre. Yeah. Uh, but uh, yeah, that, that's and it just carries on beeping until you uh, power it down. Yes, basically. essentially. Yeah, I didn't know that. Yes, but we all should have them in our homes. And well, and it'll continue to make the noise for a significant period yeah. of time whilst the reserve battery backup also dies. <laughs> oh, my mm. dad would frown upon me if I didn't have them in the house. So. No, quite. Carlos, I'm a bit freaked out. Why is that? Well, I can see your hair. <laughs> oh, no, I know. It's it's because I've turned the heater down in here, but it is quite warm in here. Right, OK, all right. And the hat just warms things up a bit. <laughs> it's just like, it's just, he's not wearing a hat, Nev. Nev, he's not wearing a hat, Nev. I don't no, like I it. <laughs> I like I like to have my hair out every now and again. Yeah. Uh, that's what she said. Yes. <clears throat> um, I suppose I better put a clock up so I don't forget what the time is. Um... Here we go. While we are <coughs> while we are, are chatting here with our lovely pre-show audience, because mm. there are a few people in the chat room today, um, we obviously, as those of you will know, we've done um, some special filming for our 500th show, which is coming up very soon, um, which is amazing. Nev and... Uh, oh. That's all right. I'm just trashing the joint. Carry on. Nev, 
uh, donned his excellent video videographer's hat um, the day, and we got some great uh, footage of of our 500th special recording. Um, we are going to have a live show to celebrate our 500th, and that is going to be on May the first. Wednesday, May the first. Wednesday, May the first. So, with that in mind, because we're not having a big meetup. Uh, for our 500th uh, this this year uh, what we are going to do is we are for those of you who fancy being with us on the live show we are going to invite you to our PTUK um, <clears throat> zoom call and join us on the live show so if you want to join me Nev Matt and all the team uh, on Wednesday May the 1st could you send us an email, the usual address, podcast at plaintalkinguk.com, and just ping us an email so we can send the Zoom link to you ready for May the 1st, uh, so uh, you'll be there for when we go live on that day. So we'd reason, love to have you in. Well, there's a reason why we're saying it now, really. We want to sort of open it to our wonderful chat room, basically. Yeah. Uh, wanted you to sort of be there, which is why we're sort of mentioning it before, and we'll mention it again afterwards. Um, just to sort of get get things set up, but it's going to be, um, <clears throat> yeah. Uh, but uh, basically, uh, you'll join uh, probably initially me at six o'clock on the Wednesday, um, while everybody else is busy getting ready and stuff. So we'll all be on a big Zoom call together, basically, to just sort of have a chat and uh, and that sort of thing. And then, um, yeah, you can uh, um, if you've ever used Zoom before, you know you can press a button to put your hand up, and then we can sort of bring you in um to sort of have a chat and things as, as yeah. part of it so it's going to be a, a a lot of fun um and then it'll go out um probably on the sunday i would say by the time it gets released as yeah. an audio and sort of finished um audio product unless things go stupidly smoothly uh, which is unlikely so <laughs> so if it doesn't need a lot of editing then we can sort of more or less put it out yeah. as is but um yeah. It's, it's gonna be nice. It'll give you guys and girls a chance to um to, to join us on a live show and be mm. part be very much a part of the show. Yes. Um so You'll if also... you do fancy that, ping us an email. Send us an email, let us know that you want to be uh, on the show with us. It may the first. So it's a nice yeah. easy Wednesday, one to remember. Wednesday, May the first. May the first. Yeah, Wednesday, absolutely. May the first. Indeed. Uh, uh, will you be joining us for that, Neville? Will you be washing your hair? Oh no, I, I shall. I shall be there. <laughs> Definitely, yeah. Um, quite a lot of editing to do before then. Obviously, uh, yes. No, I appreciate uh, no, you've got your hands full a bit prior to that. Um, and uh, lots of drone editing to do still. Yes. Um, but we're cracking on with that quite nicely. We've got a good segment to play out tonight, actually, um, from Shane at Munster Drone Services. That was very interesting. We spent a lot um, of time with Shane and and the guys there, actually, didn't we? Because because yeah. they were. They were more or less opposite where we'd camped out, weren't they? Mm. Yeah, that was really um, good. They had some very nice kit on offer for sale. They as well. did, yeah. Now, actually, he said uh, that big drone, which you'll see in a bit of a cage thing, he says that was €60,000, including the controller. How and, much? And the point cloud mapping thing. Now, that is uh, more than a Focus ST. Um, <laughs> Just a little, but yeah. But not much because they, you know, yeah. things, the blue oval boys. They yeah, yeah, the yeah. Uh, they they yeah. they know how to um, <laughs> they know how to find um, yes, they know how to open a check. Perhaps that'll be it. the next big thing. Nev Ford will start making UAVs. Oh, good lord! Can you imagine? <sighs> well, actually, I, I've just finished editing uh, an episode, uh, a, a drone summit uh, segment with my customer from work, uh, Justin, uh, when we discussed, you know, how long is it going to be before, if he wants to go from Dublin to Shannon or, you know, somewhere down in Limerick and doesn't want to take the car because of the traffic, he jumps in his drone and he flies himself. And um, so, yeah, next week you'll hear all about that. Obviously there's some, you know, artistic license required with <laughs> some of the things that we came up with uh but it's interesting isn't it interesting uh, how long it might be before uh we'll we could mm. be powering ourselves um i don't think that'll be happening in my lifetime somehow 
But no, I'm not sure I'm ready for it, if I'm honest with you. So. Well, judging by the quality of driving that I see on the race <laughs> motorways uh, yeah. and A and B roads in this country, that is a horrific mm. prospect to see uh, amateur people, uh, including myself, whizzing around in a sort of a... Yeah. Uh, a UAV, but with somebody in it. If you see what mm, I, mean. <laughs> I agree. Oh dear. I agree. But yeah, I, I tell you what, I, I, I learned so much that weekend mm. in Dublin about the, the regulations and you know the the compliance and there's a whole load of stuff out there, isn't there? Um, but Crazy, they, all it? for the right reasons too. Mm. It's got, got to be safe. Definitely, totally agree there. Uh, six minutes, guys, just so that you know. Very good. Excellent. Uh, what else have we done this week? Okay, so I was down in uh, Torquay this week, down in the, the West Country, the South West, uh, the English Riviera, as it's called, uh, although it was a bit wet when I was there. Uh, that's not far from where Nick Codling lives. So we had a very nice dinner at the Hole in the Wall pub. Uh, that was very pleasing, I have to say. Really enjoyed that. Um, and... Uh, uh, Gave him a new camera as well, so hopefully uh, we'll get a slightly better video from him next time. Um, and uh, yeah, he's, he's uh, he did say he's very much enjoying doing all the, the show notes. And uh, what you guys and girls don't realise is that his contribution to the show, along with Owens and other people's as well, is absolutely enormous. I mean, mm -hmm. he does an awful lot of work behind the scenes, and and very often by the the, the Monday of the week when we're doing the show most of the show is already put together mm. um and that makes our life a, a whole lot you know oh, God, easier yeah, also of course it enables you if there's a, a an incident or a bit of breaking news that's come up we want to cover but we can drop it in but uh, so much of the show is already done by the previous weekend or the following monday so that's really really valuable for us so thank you nick mm. for all of your efforts we really appreciate it mm. absolutely five minutes <clears throat> Anyone seen what the um, forecast is doing for the Easter break? I don't need to look. I know what it's going to be like. It's spank holiday weekend, so it's going to be wet and horrible. Oh, yes. <laughs> of course. I don't need to look it up. There's no Standard need. Standard issue, yeah. Easter weather. Standard. Well, actually, no. Tomorrow will be fantastic because it's the last day at work. I'm then actually it... off. No, but you see, but, no. see, the problem is, is because I'm off, it means it will be horrible tomorrow as well. Because whenever I'm off, it's horrible. I tell you what just, you could do, I've just um, <laughs> Matt. Is could you ask your weather chum? I could, yes. Who who really knows what he's talking he about? And I have full confidence in him. Mm -hmm. Why is it that the BBC weather app is basically 180 degrees out of phase? <laughs> in other words, if it says it's going to be raining, the sun will come out, and vice versa. I don't. Now, presumably they're all they're all pulling their data from similar sources. So, so this is actually the thing, Nev, and I don't know if I'm saying this and whether I'm allowed to, uh, but I'm going to say it anyway because we're not live mm. yet. Uh, he gets into trouble when he, because he, as you know, he does look east here, so he does our local program, uh, and he doesn't he he doesn't use the BBC London weather data uh, because he's a, 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 a meteorologist. Um, and has access to his own resources, uh, the company he works for, he uses those resources to decide what the weather is going to be and builds the map accordingly. Um, and they get a bit cross about it because <laughs> obviously, it's, as you oh. say, it's quite often very different to the forecast that's being um, uh, peddled uh, from it, London. It didn't, use, it didn't used to be too <laughs> no. bad, but in the last year or so, it's been way out. Perhaps not not do, even close. Uh, do you know uh, why? No, I can't imagine. Okay, so uh, I think uh, I think uh, you'll find it's probably been pretty rubbish for the last uh, sort of uh, twenty-four months, and the reason why is uh, the Met Office and the BBC contract came to an end, and they now use a different company called Meteor. Ah, yes, they do, don't they? Yes, mm. and that, that I was always I was down in Exeter uh, this week as well, um, which is where the Met Office head mm. office is now having moved from Bracknell a, a while ago um, I'd really like to find a way of uh, popping in there to see how it all works uh, Mr Bounds if you wait until after July I can make that happen oh okay very good uh, we're, be about, nice. we're, we're about to lose Dan 
because oh, okay. that's where he's going to. Ah, oh, excellent. So, uh, okay. Let him get his feet under the table, and I'm yeah. <laughs> I'm sure that that could be... Yeah, it'd be poor to, for us to turn up with a camera yeah, crew. Not, not on his Thursday, first day, I think that's a bit no. much, isn't it? It's a bit much, like, hi! <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so, no, that's, yes, that'll yes. be nice. Cause I'd like to know a bit more about mm. the Met and, and how it works. Well, and Dan, Dan is your man, great. definitely, because yeah. he, he yeah. very much knows the subject of a weather. Mm. Um, but, yeah... Yes, be... yes, Richard Adams says, good job the Met Office moved from Bracknell. The office there was uh, uh, subject to regular flooding. <laughs> <laughs> Massively ironic, isn't it? It's, it's, just... Just like, it's like, but they should have known. They should have known yeah. it was coming. <laughs> yeah. It's a bit like it's fortune it. tellers, isn't it? It's just mm. like, mind you, it's a similar science, let's be honest. <laughs> well, yeah, the way it's been going, definitely. But, <coughs> no, I'd be interested to get some more... Uh, some more mm. intel on how that all works. Well, I'm sure that can be arranged in time. Yeah, nice. Mm. Brilliant. Indeed. 30 seconds, everyone. Okie dokie. Are we all prepped and ready? Barely. Fair enough. <laughs> you on Sky News. Why? What, what are they saying? No, I'm just looking at the update on that um, bridge collapsing. Yeah, it's awful, isn't it, really? Apparently the bridge was strangely closed. It was only um, pothole crews and stuff. The, the May Day, they got out in time, apparently. Terrible. Mm, really was awful, wasn't it? But could have been a lot worse. So very easily. Nev's doing his hair. He's getting ready. Obviously. <laughs> got his brill cream in. Quite right. Ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three. Well, hello and welcome to episode 496 of the Plain Talking UK podcast. I'm Carlos and in this week's packed show, we've got a scrapped Dreamliner, a jail captain, and we look at women in aviation and hear about a big boom in the Mojave Desert. Meanwhile, we have a tale of the unexpected. We've got another interview from our trip to the Drone Summit in Dublin. And friend of the show, Rory On Air, is back to talk about flying with the Scottish Air Ambulance. So we've got another pack caption this competition as well this week as well, which is going to be awesome. Some great comments on there. And we have got a little bit of military news. And Nev's going to announce the winner of this week's book prize so joining me this week across literally just literally just across that that housing estate there <laughs> it's matt smith did you say we ha we've still got military well i know i just sort of make jonathan ear uh, warner's ears prick up right but okay no, get I, the shock I, of his life I, later I, i'm astounded <laughs> i was gonna say i've seen the schedule there's way too much to try and cram in <laughs> Honestly, it's the only reason Nev's here this week, isn't it, mate? I know. <laughs> and if, honestly, if, if the PTUK viewers could, to, to, were privy to the conversation that we have in our uh, host chat on WhatsApp, it would be quite amusing. No, I, I think, think that's a good thing. Uh, yes. <laughs> anyway, hello, Matt. How are you? I'm all right, thank you. You? Yes, I'm good. How's the... I, I, I detect that you've finally got rid of that blinking cough. No, I wish. Oh, OK. No, it's still lung lingering on. I shall still be hacking up in the middle of a story here and there. Don't okay. worry. Uh, I'd, I'd hate for, you know, I've had it since January. I'd hate for you to miss it. You know, I mean, it's I was just... Start, like... I was literally on, on going to text my friend with a brass band to come around and play to, you know... Yes, yes, yes. Hopefully, celebrate. hopefully. Nearly there. It's just such a... It'll, it'll, <sighs> when, I'm not, when I'm no longer doing the radio and things like that, that's when it will get better, I think. I no doubt. <laughs> and joining us from across the glens, the dales, the rivers... And the motorways of the UK is our resident 
aficionado of all things seat 1A and BA is, of course, Neville Bounds. Yes, and Rivers sums it up very nicely around here. Though. It has been throwing it down mm. most of the day. Uh, and I drove up from Brighton, where our office is down there. <clears throat> and uh, yes, uh, aquaplaning was occurring, I have to say. Oh, um, not, with, not, not in the ST. <gasps> even with four very good tyres on it. So uh, yes, one has to be a bit careful. I bet. Uh, but, um, yes, no, all good. Thank you very much. Been a busy week at work, a short week, um, but we still have to cram in five days of work into four, it would appear. Um, <laughs> and the same will go for next week yeah. as well, by the looks of things. Um, so, uh, yes, it's been been hectic. No flying this week, but we're doing a bit of flying on Saturday. Mrs Nev and I are going to Belfast uh, for the weekend. Uh, we're going back to the Titanic Museum. Oh, lovely. As well, where the uh, AV systems have had a nice refresh. So I'm going to have a look at that, make sure everybody's doing it all properly. Very good, and yes, yes, yes. And a minor meal in the evening at the Hilton uh, as well. Uh, so that'll be nice. That so, sounds, yeah, that sounds better, just awful. We know, we know what the weather's like in Belfast or can be like in Belfast. So uh, that'll be an interesting approach into Belfast. City <laughs> Airport. Don't tell <laughs> Mrs Nev because she's not keen on that kind of... Shh, shh, shh. Damn, it'll all be fine. It'll all be fine. Yeah. <laughs> so, as you can probably notice, Armando's not with us this week. He is actually flying an aircraft, but not at the front part of the aircraft. He's sitting in the back in coach. He's informed us, but he's probably at this point, he's probably in the air uh, flying somewhere in the US. So, he can't be with us this week. And uh, do Nick. You, do, you, do you remember what coach is, um, Nev, just out of interest? <laughs> Isn't that what you used to drive? Correct. Yeah. Yeah, no, that is correct. That's absolutely... Yeah, absolutely. 100%. <laughs> <laughs> oh, uh, but, uh, we, like I said, we have got lots to get through. We're going to say a quick hello to everyone in the YouTube chat room who's joined us tonight. Uh, Mazus, he was in there nice and early. Hello. Richard Adams as well. James Taylor. Rare visit from him in there this evening. Uh, David Kavanagh's also in there. He, he was in and then I think he went out again. Captain Cruz. Uh, Dirk. Hello, Dirk S. Wouldn't be the chat room without you in there, Dirk. Uh, Hobby Time is also there. Graham Haley. Uh, good to see you in there, Graham. Uh, not seen you since uh, Duxford. We met up at Duxford, didn't we? Last oh, that year. was a good day, that yeah. was. That really was. Uh, Richard E. Flagg. Hello to you as well. Captain Cruz, Tanya, hello Tanya, lovely to see you in there Tanya. Uh, Bill is also in there, good to see you Bill. Sturman, hello Sturman, he was getting an education just a moment ago and what that is behind me here. <laughs> uh, so well done Sturman. Oh, is that one uh, of them L1011 yawn fest well, things, is it? Yeah, well Sturman got that hideously wrong. Uh, APG show, hello to you. John Jester, hello, John. Good to see you in there. Masha, the lovely Masha, good to see you as well. And thanks to everyone who's tuned in this evening for the show, mm -hmm. this live show on this Wednesday, uh, the 27th of, well, can you believe it, March. We're nearly into April already. Uh, don't forget, if you're watching us uh, on YouTube, you can also hear the audio part of the show as well. If you're downloading that, um, you can find us on Spotify, iTunes. But if you are watching us on YouTube, uh, we are on there. Just search for Plain Talking UK and click the subscribe and bell icon as well to be notified where Matt has pressed the live button. Or you sometimes, or to be fair. It's not always me. Or me, yeah. <laughs> so, Nev, we've got loads to get through, haven't we? Oh yes, we're in, we're not short of uh, commercial stories and some videos tonight. So, mm, uh, yes. So Matt, yes, if you're ready, uh, let's gonna... hit some buttons. The captain has turned on the seatbelt light. Please take your seats and fasten your seatbelts. So, the first story in the commercial this week comes to us from aviationweek.com. And the first GE-powered 787 acquired for part out. And there's a lovely piece of wall there just crying out for it. <laughs> At the maturity 
Uh, Boeing 787 fleet and the manufacturer's inability to meet promised specifications on some of its earliest airframes has opened the door for a rare teardown opportunity. Banger Main located CNL Engineering or Engine Solutions announced that we are marketing the material from a parted out GE Aerospace Gen X 1B powered 787-8. The aircraft, serial number 35507, is the first production GE powered 787 to be disassembled in the US. And that will be the first time a new 787 will be disassembled anywhere in the world. The aircraft has only ferry flight time on the clock. Um, God, you can sell it to me if you like. Uh, disassembling a virtually new 787, having only a few ferry cycles that haven't been done before. Cloud Investment Partners Managing Director David Weiss said, We recognize the benefit of new parts in the market to assist OEMs in supporting their customers as well as providing source for airlines to purchase hard-to-find parts. The aircraft is no ordinary 787, rolled out back in 2010 as line number 17. It was one of a group of early 787s with higher than specification empty weights that caused their original customers to balk at them dubbed the terrible teens because of their problems. Boeing eventually found buyers for them and serial number 35507 was initially ordered by Maroc, uh, Royal Maroc Air Maroc in November 2005 in a four aircraft deal. But the airline declined to take it, putting it back on the market. Uh, after five years of storage following its rollout, Boeing Business Jets brought the aircraft in a paper transaction for a VIP customer. It was then sold two more times by November 2021, landing in a fund link to Resorts World Las Vegas. In between, it was remarketed as a VIP aircraft pending delivery, but was never modified. Aside from a few ferry hops, it spent its entire existence in storage. Oh. The aircraft will be parted out in Roswell, New Mexico by Cavu Aerospace, with the resulting components taken to C&L's warehouse in Wichita, Kansas. C&L added that uh, it is working with OEMs to utilise the parts in supplementing their current inventories. The timing of the project for the 787 is perfect. C&L Engineering Solutions President Tim Breacher said the 787 fleet is hitting the 12-year mark from its first deliveries and entering a busy schedule for heavy maintenance. The shortage of spares in our marketplace, combined with the ongoing challenges in the supply chain, make this project critical to OEMs and operators. So the 787s that made up the terrible teens got their names because of the extra empty weight they acquired through extensive change and incorporation required to fix structural issues and bring the aircraft up to certification standards. The problem was then discovered in the wing body join area doing load limit tests on the static uh, airframes in May 2009 and centred on high stress loads at the top end of the stringers under the upper skin of the wing. When the wheel uh, wing, or in the wing, I should say, flexed, tests showed that the stress levels at the junction of the wing with the side body caused composite skin structure to delaminate. The issue was solved by redistributing the loads through making a U-shaped cutout at the ends of the upper wing stringers, as well as titanium fasteners to the ends of the reshaped stringers. The junction of the stringers with upper skin was also strengthened with additional fasteners. The fix which was applied to the initial batch of production aircraft from line number 7 to 19 added weight and required costly maintenance and inspection programs and that was specifically tailored to limit the fleet. Together with the impact of other structural systems, inefficiencies with Boeing gradually redesigned out of the aircraft over the later batches. The argument augmented strengthening resulted in a terrible teen fleet believed to be around 13,000 500 pounds overweight. That is I'm just a looking that up cakes. Uh, on the internet. Um, <clears throat> that's 6.1 metric tons Oof. overweight. Oof. That is a lot. Goodness Ow. me. That's Goodness a serious, so serious issue with carrying fuel, full fuel passengers and mm. cargo nev. Yeah. Definitely. But I do see the point, though, when you have got a shortage of parts, which there is at the moment um, within the supply chains, I suppose this is a an obvious thing to do with an aircraft that's barely been around the block. The same. Yeah. yeah. Now, Nev, you have got the next story, and um, 
Have you been on the old Pinot lately, Nev? Oh dear, That's another another one of these stories. It's very sad, but it's not the first time we've had to report on this. It's uh, on uh, uh, fl360aero.com, uh, and it's about the Delta pilot who was over the alcohol limit has been uh, jailed for 10 months. Uh, it says that a pilot will serve the jail term for attempting to buy a uh, fly a Boeing 767 aircraft from Edinburgh to New York while significantly over the legal alcohol limit with previous DUI convictions and expressing remorse over his actions. Uh, on that day, Captain Russell was found with nearly two and a half times over the legal limit for alcohol in aviation. The incident occurred at Edinburgh Airport when Russell was found with two bottles of Jägermeister in his hand luggage, Woof. one of which was half empty during a bag search. His blood alcohol level was high and clearly above the aviation maximum of 20 milligrams per 100 millilitres. Russell, who has two previous convictions for driving under the influence, was preparing to fly a Boeing 767 at the time of his arrest. Scottish prosecutor Lynn Barry said in a separate statement he showed a reckless disregard for the safety of his passengers and crew. The pilot of a commercial aircraft holds the lives of hundreds in his hands. This conviction should send the message that crimes of this nature will be robustly dealt with. Uh, she said. Russell, who's a recovering alcoholic, hadn't consumed alcohol for 277 days prior to the incident and had successfully completed a recovery programme. Despite his recovery efforts and expressions of remorse, the court believed that the risks inherent in his actions as potentially catastrophic, highlighting the safety breach and endangering the lives of the occupants. The Procurator Fiscal for Lothian and Borders underscored the seriousness with which such offences are treated in the aviation, uh, in the aviation industry, emphasising the commitment to ensuring passenger and crew safety. Uh, on the, the development, Sheriff Alison Sterling pointed out the high level of culpability in Russell's actions and the potential for grave harm, leading to the decision that incarceration was the only suitable punishment. The 10-month sentence that has actually been reduced from 15 months due to Russell's early guilty plea aims to underscore the critical importance of adhering to aviation safety and legal standards, especially concerning alcohol consumption. After the incident, Russell successfully completed a recovery program at a rehabilitation centre. He was diagnosed with severe alcohol use disorder but is now in remission. Sterling added, noting that Russell had um, expressed remorse and that he had support of his family. Delta said that Russell is no longer employed by the company. Delta was aware of this incident and removed the pilot from service whilst conducting a thorough investigation in coordination with the Scottish authorities, the airline said. Just just a random inquiry from me, really, Nev. You may not know the answer to this, to be fair, but will, will he serve his sentence here or will he serve his sentence in the States? Uh, I think that's probably ne negotiated with the, uh, the various authorities. My understanding mm. is that it's normally served in the country of where the offence was committed. Right, OK. Um, unless there's some uh, bail conditions or there's some negotiation between uh, the US and the Scottish authorities. But right. I don't actually know the answer to that. No, um, but um, mm. it's a very sad story, this one. Um, and... If if it if you need it to, to serve to serve as a warning as about what can go wrong, then this is it. Mm. Um, and I think that no matter how many thousands of dollars people have played for, are paid for their training and the number of years that they've been, um, not, not number of hours they've got on the clock as a first officer or a captain. Mm. Temptation to do something like this down route is there and you have to just be fully aware of what those consequences are which is no booze basically and if he was just doing a night stop there and he did have this other alcohol in his baggage as well in his hand baggage so yeah it's um, I can't really say anything more about it because it, it's just so obvious but clearly there are people out there with issues as well and yeah. this is uh, a another warning of, of what can happen uh, when you are caught 
Well, and, and goodness only knows the potential repercussions, as you say, of uh, of sh should that not have been identified perhaps before the flight. Uh, if, if indeed there had been flights where it hadn't been identified before, of course, you, you, you mm. do wonder. Yeah, but, um, yeah, there is that, of course, yes, yeah. Now, Matt, you've got the next story, and uh, this news broke earlier in the week. I think pretty much the whole world would have seen this when it um, came online. Yes, indeed. Uh, we'll take a, a look at... Uh, so is it Calhoun? Home? Calhoun. Calhoun. Calhoun, thank you. Apologies yeah. for that. Uh, so theguardian.com is where this story has come from. That's The Guardian here in the UK, that newspaper there. And Calhoun announces plans to, res res uh, to resign amid biggest safety crisis for Boeing since crashes of two of its MAX jets in 2018-2019. The CEO of Boeing has announced plans to resign uh, amid a sweeping overhaul of the plane maker's management as it fights to repair its reputation uh, following a terrifying cabin panel blowout. Uh, David Calhoun will step down at the end of the year. Larry Kellner, chair of Boeing's board of directors, will also leave the role. Calhoun uh, plans to complete the critical work underway to stabilise and position the company for the future over uh, the coming months, it said. Uh, Boeing has scrambled to reassure regulators, airliners and passengers since a brand new 737 MAX 9 jet was forced into emergency landing back in January. Dan Steele, who leads Boeing's commercial airlines business, has also left the job with immediate effect. He has been replaced by Stephanie Pope, the group's chief operating officer. The eyes of the world are on us, and I know that we will come through this moment a better company, Calhoun said. Uh, we will remain squarely focused on completing the work we have done together to return our company to stability after the extraordinary challenges of the past five years, with safety and quality at the forefront of everything that we do. Those who last recruited a CEO for Boeing did not look far. Calhoun took the job in January 2020, uh, was a veteran of the group's board and served as a chairman for a few months the previous year. I want to thank Dave for his tremendous leadership of our company, said Kellner, and I know he will finish the job this year that he started in 2020 to position Boeing and our employees for a stronger future. Uh, Calhoun was, who was quick to acknowledge Boeing had uh, much to prove following the Alaska Airlines panel blowout, was himself appointed four years ago after the group faced intense criticism for its response to the fatal MAX 8 crashes of 2018 and 2019. Key customers welcomed the news of the company's management overhaul. The changes were much needed, according to Michael O'Leary, boss of Ryanair. A focus will now turn to who Boeing will select as its next boss. Uh, Justin Green, an attorney who represents 34 families who lost loved ones on Ethiopian Flight 302, which crashed in 2019, said Calhoun's departure was positive but quite late. Uh, the next CEO must know that his or her role will be to prioritise safety, not just profit, added Green. For too long, Boeing has been avoiding public accountability and these leadership changes open a window for the company to do so. Mm. Ooh, yes. It begs the question, doesn't it? Who in their right mind is, is going to want to take on that position now at, at Boeing. I mean, you, you could argue that this, this. I mean, in some respects, he's almost become the escape, you know, like the scapegoat for, for this now, really, because whoever comes in now can say, well, obviously, that's all in the past. That management has gone now in time for a new slate. So, I mean, you know, for somebody who... For, for somebody who's perhaps ambitious, who knows what they're doing and really thinks that they can, you know, turn things round there, they, they, there is potential here for it to, to be in charge. I mean, you know, and if they're successful, um, I mean, what a, what a thing to have on your CV if you can indeed turn around the misfortunes of, of Boeing. So I think there'll be plenty of people interested in, in the role. Well, nobody's bothered to contact me yet. Um, but It's only a suggestion... matter of time, Niv. Well, you know, yeah, my suggestion is they give Alan Mulally a quick call because I think he was one of the best uh, CEOs that Boeing ever had. This is going back from 1998 to 2006. And because I'm a fan of the Blue Oval, obviously he was president and chief executive mm. officer of the 
Ford Motor Company from 2006 to 2014. Uh, so he has got a long history of getting stuff done and he was also responsible, I think he was one of the leads on the Boeing original Boeing 777 programme as well. There's a great documentary uh, on television that they ran at the time about mm. the story of how they built the 777 and, and he was the, one of the leading fellows at the time. But um, yeah, I mean, they, they've got to sort this out. This is just horrific, isn't it, um, mm. otherwise? Yeah, whoever, whoever takes that position has got a lot of work to do, I think, now. Yep, you're not wrong, mate. Yeah, indeed. Next up, simpleflying.com. And, um, and this is a good one for you, Max. I know you love your tech stuff. Uh, American Airlines to begin offering free uh, ad or free ad based Wi Fi. Not sure if I like the word ad, but so American Airlines is tweaking its policy regarding how passengers can access Wi Fi on board its aircraft. In the next few weeks, passengers will get the option to pay for the service using their miles or even opt for free accessibility, which is sponsored by ads. Oh, blimey. If not not for you then, hey. <laughs> that's why I pay my three ninety nine a month. Yeah, anyway, yeah. if you're booked to travel on domestic American Airlines aircraft in the coming weeks or months, then chances are you can use your AA or American Airlines Advantage miles to access on board Wi-Fi. The carrier announced it will start rolling out this new feature in the next few weeks on some selected aircraft, and it will include it all, uh, all of the airline's Viasat-equipped narrow-bodied aircraft by the summer season. However, there's something for passengers looking for free Wi-Fi option as well. American Airlines will allow ad-sponsored Wi-Fi across 100% of the American Viasat domestic narrow-body aircraft. The carrier also promises longer gate-to-gate -gate connectivity on mainline aircraft from the moment that passengers find their seats until they deplane at their destination. American says that the onboard internet connectivity upgrades will be powered by a new design for the Wi-Fi portal that will offer a more user-friendly and purchase with pro uh, process fewer clicks as well and affect direct to customer communication through strategic strategic i like that word pop-up measuring or messaging uh, but what if you are traveling on the carrier's regional aircraft american and intel sat will start with installing high-speed wi-fi on nearly 500 dual class regional aircraft this summer so that its customers across all routes can stay connected the airline already offers Wi-Fi on board its mainline fleet of more than 1,000 aircraft. American offers streaming capabilities on its entire mainline fleet, allowing travelers to access one of the regularly updated one and a half pieces of free content on in-flight entertainment. The airline updates approximately 200 titles monthly inspired by current entertainment trends, such as award-winning films each year and other special curated content. From being a novelty a few years ago, Wi-Fi access is fast becoming mainstream across all global carriers. Airlines understand the need for passengers to remain connected during their flight and are even using this to market their onboard service to attract more travelers. Many airlines are now offering free Wi-Fi on their aircraft, which is rapidly becoming one of the primary factors in how customers choose the airline they travel on. Singapore Airlines, they started offering unlimited free Wi-Fi in all travel classes last year, while Etihad and Emirates both include free Wi-Fi for the members of their respective loyalty programs. JetBlue, uh, they offer unlimited Wi-Fi to all travelers at high speeds, and Delta has also started offering free Wi-Fi to all SkyMiles members. As the services in the aviation industry evolve, airlines will have to include free onboard connectivity options to say more competitive. So Wi-Fi on board, we've all used it, and I know you definitely used it as well, Matt, on one of your recent flights. And actually, um, when we flew to Dublin, you, you, you used something a bit different to Wi-Fi to order your meal, didn't you? On I board did, Ryanair. yeah. So uh, with, uh, with Ryanair, uh, and it was done through Bluetooth. It wasn't done through Wi-Fi. It was done through Bluetooth, basically, which meant you could order um, your panini, or I think in my case I had... Well, I wanted, I wanted coffee in a Toblerone, and I tried to order coffee in a Toblerone every time. <laughs> um, uh, but it's like that. But essentially, uh, no Toblerone. I, I couldn't have Toblerone. Um, but, uh, yeah. Uh, 
56 kilobit, kilobits per second at 500 miles per hour. Is that what they mean by high speed? Uh, very much so, yes, absolutely. Now, actually, you, you're, you're mentioning speeds because it was also when I came back from... Um, not, not when I went out, I have to say, but when I came back from the States... And the main reason why is because uh, the only negative I would say um, is that you couldn't, you had to be on the ground to set it up before you could, because um, I, I needed like, because I didn't, well I suppose it's probably my fault because I didn't have my card on me basically, my card is like in my app, um, and because I didn't have internet connection Obviously, until you'd paid for it, if you like. I couldn't do it on the way out there. But coming home, I got wise to it. I got it all sorted out and all that kind of thing. Um, in terms of speed, um, I mean, I must have... I suppose the only thing is, is I only used it to stream um, the radio. So I was listening to uh, Park Radio basically all the way home. Now, I suppose, to be fair, now, that's probably not a, a great test for the speed because it was only 128 kilobits per second that we were streaming so it was like cd quality and what kind of thing and actually in in this day and age that's not really quite it's not really very high is it in terms of um, no. throughput um no but i have to say for that entire flight it didn't miss I, I was i was happily sending videos and whatsapps backwards and forwards and all that kind of thing whilst listening to the radio and um it, it didn't miss a beat i mean i did i didn't lose i didn't lose connection for a single moment it streamed continuously for the sort of five five and a half six hours that i was tuned in um which i think is pretty good considering that you're yeah, it, you know i it's wonder how long it'll be nev before ba offer free wi-fi because obviously even yourself flying business class with BA, you still have to, if you want to access the Wi-Fi, you still have to pay, don't you? Oh, yes. Um, so the flight to Belfast on Saturday coming up will be four ninety nine, uh, one way. And for the longer routes, uh, seven ninety nine to go to Stockholm, one way. Um, and in some of their older fleets, of course, some of the older 319s and 320s, they don't have any Wi-Fi at all. Uh, there's there's quite a few aircraft that still don't have Wi-Fi uh, on the short haul fleet. Um, long haul is a different story. Having said that, the 787-8, which you would expect to have Wi-Fi, uh, so when I went to Portland uh, on that you know, back in January, there was no Wi-Fi at all. Uh, the aircraft is not equipped with it, but they are planning to roll them roll it out later in the year. But you would have thought, wouldn't you, with uh, long haul aircraft, even on the Dash Eight, that they would have had it. But uh, I thought uh, BA brought their their Dreamliners with the Wi-Fi already installed. Nev, uh, not the Dash Eights, no, and mm. maybe not even the Dash Nines actually. So, the, but I did. I do remember we did a, a story about this probably last year where we talked about uh, what they were going to do to to bring it on. So they're going to start taking aircraft out of service to to retrofit it, basically. But uh, yeah, it's a it's a ten, ten hour flight is a long slog without any Wi-Fi, isn't it? But unless you're flying with Emirates, because air in-flight entertainment is absolutely awesome. Well, mm. yeah. yeah. To be fair, Americans was pretty good. The offering there, mm. there, was, there was lots of things for me to sort of get my teeth into. Um, I say, which is why I genuinely didn't miss. Um, the, 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 it was only really just because you know I wanted to sort of like message you guys, basically saying <laughs> I'm on an airplane <laughs> and I'm sending pictures <laughs> and videos <laughs> um, because I'm essentially a child. Uh, but uh, yeah, I, that, that was the only reason I, I, you know, that's the only reason I spent my thirty dollars in order to have an in-air connection. Um, you know, you're right there, Carlos. <laughs> thirty dollars. <laughs> Yeah, my me. Yeah, it, it wasn't that cheap. went down the wrong way. Yeah, yes, I bet. Yeah, indeed. Um, but uh, I, <laughs> you know, uh, you was it value for money? Uh, I mean, I enjoyed it. <laughs> so I guess you could argue, perhaps. Uh, although it did kind of make me think I need to use this as much as I can purely to get value for money out of this. But uh, but yeah, you know, it was it, it's, uh, it was it was a it was a good service. It was surprisingly stable. Really surprisingly stable. Yeah. Be able, be able. I think it was a Philips system they use, isn't it? American Airlines. Is that uh, really cool? No, don't. indeed. Okay. I, I tell you what, Matt. I wouldn't. I'm actually. I'm surprised that Ryanair didn't roll out Wi-Fi on board their aircraft and then charge for it. I know a lot of their routes are very short, 
and don't really credit but I, I it's just it's another revenue stream that i'm sure ryanair could make an absolute fortune on is uh would they though phone because phone. you know if they're charging the likes of 20 or 30 euros and you've only got a three hour flight i mean i don't think even i would i mean i might do it once be- for the novelty of having wi-fi <laughs> on a ryanair aircraft but uh, um yeah, I, I, I don't know. I, I think actually the reason why they've done it is p- probably because they wouldn't make money from it. That's the reality. It'd probably cost them too much. Yeah. The, the extra bubble on top of the fuselage would, would uh, cost them an extra <laughs> 20 quid a mile. Quite, yeah. Anyway, on the subject of uh, Ryanair, now have you got the next story? Yeah, this is on uh, aviation24.be. Uh, it says that uh, Ryanair CEO Michael O'Leary has revealed plans to order several dozen Airbus A320 aircraft to expand the fleet of subsidiary Louder Europe. Despite uh, Ryanair's traditional reliance on 737 aircraft for its uniform fleet, uh, O'Leary aims to grow Louder Europe's current fleet of 27 A320s up to 50 aircraft of the same type. The decision reflects a strategy to streamline operations and minimise costs associated with spare parts, crew training and maintenance. Whilst the A320s were initially introduced to the Ryanair Group through the acquisition of Louder Europe, O'Leary intends to retain them rather than replace them with 737s, citing additional expenses that would be incurred through crew retraining. However, due to Airbus's existing order backlog, new A320 deliveries are not expected until 2030, prompting O'Leary to explore options to extend lease contracts for existing A320s until then. Yeah, I can imagine that if you mm. start trying to swap that lot out for seven threes, that is a whole load of uh, dollars for crew training, maintenance, and everything to go with it. Um, so, although they do, it- although they do have the facilities, that's the thing, isn't it? Because it's not like they're moving to a, an aircraft that the Ryanair Group is not familiar with, as well. You could argue that the Ryanair Group is less familiar with the A three twenty, and you know, sort of what's what's involved there I, i'm i'm a little bit the other way actually i'm a bit surprised that they're they're sort of going to persevere if you like with the well it's because they've already got 27 mm. you see i think if they had five or six they yeah. might go well we'll just chop it and we'll we'll go with the seven three but of course there's a backlog on 737 yeah. deliveries as well for the reasons we mentioned in the previous stories yeah. um so uh, ryan has got 400 on order at the moment um, so th- there's going to be delays there. And so, he ain't getting them, um, is he? Yes. <laughs> no, he, thing, yeah. he's, he's not getting them when he wants them, is he? Yeah. So, uh, yeah, that, that's a problem. But, uh, no, I think it does make sense because they've got so many of the existing A320s yeah. uh, okay. to, to stick with that. Uh, but, uh, you, yeah, it's you, a problem. No. Do you think some of it is that, I mean, I know they're saying, mind you, they say now that it's like 2030s when they're going to start getting these these extra 320s i mean part of me was wondering if the reason why he was thinking well let's explore the 320 route is because they're more readily available but they're not at the end of the day are they in reality no and also that's why he's talking about uh leasing as well mm. and of course uh, as always and uh, our chum alan white in the chat room who is best placed to answer this as well uh, engines are different from airframes as well so again uh, engines very often are leased from different companies right. uh, compared to those of the airframe itself. Um, so, uh, but obviously there's some negotiation to be done there, depending on when they can get the uh, uh, get the uh, the new products. But yeah, 2030 is uh, some way off, isn't it? Six mm. years, a few yeah. years yeah. off, isn't it? Yeah, it is. Yeah. Not as far as away as it was. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it sounds it sounds like a far away, distant time, doesn't it? 2030. Yeah. But as yeah. you say, actually, in reality, it's, it's, yeah, it's 2025 only, next year. It's only six years away. That's scary. That's scary. How, how did we all end up being so old? No. I don't, I don't understand what happened. <laughs> Nev's just well, getting younger every year. Well, that's oh, true. Yeah. Don't. Yeah. <laughs> Definitely not. This next story comes to us from simpleflying.com and uh, throwback to when Southwest Airlines reduced aircraft weight by reupholstering their seats. What? Okay. <laughs> 
So back in 2024, uh, 2014, sorry, back in 2014, um, US carrier Southwest Airlines decided to reupholster the seats on its colossal fleet of 737 aircraft. Replacing the fabric covering of all its seats fleet wire was a big deal, not only concerning time and money spent on the project, but also in terms of the, wa terms of the waste generated from such an undertaking. Thankfully, however, there were some benefits on the move. The refurbishment wasn't just a move to update and renew cabins, it was also hailed as an environmental measure. This was namely because the seats had been reupholstered with a material known as, really, e-leather. Sounds like oh, some God. sort of um, electrified something or other. Anyway, created using scraps of discarded, or scraps discarded by the leather industry, the usage of e-leather has severely tangled benefits, or tangible benefits, I should say. However, the main draw was that this new material was lighter than what was already being used on Southwest aircraft. Indeed, each aircraft was made, ready for this, here we go, big numbers, 600 pounds, or 272 kilograms lighter with the use of e-leather in the reupholstering. Uh, while that amount only represents a fraction of the weight of Boeing's 737, a Southwest Airlines operates at huge numbers. This is still a significant figure in the grand scheme of things, given the fact that most airlines around the world limit each passenger's checked baggage to 23 kilos per piece. It equates to almost 12 checked bags at their maximum allowable weight. It may or may not be impressive but for some, but this small weight saving clearly makes a significant difference when the bigger picture is taken into account. This is particularly prominent in for the carrier with a fleet size such as Southwest's, with the airline having begun this year with almost 800 aircraft at its disposal. Many of these jets rack up roughly nine hours of time in the air every day. Therefore, when considering the number of aircraft and the amount of flying conducted daily, shedding £600 on board every single aircraft would save the airline a lot of money through the reduced fuel consumption. Given the tight margins of its low-cost model, this is naturally a high priority for airlines such as Southwest. E-Leather claims that it's uh, using its materials in aircraft upholstery results in reduced fuel burn on takeoff and subsequent savings of around $10,000 per year uh, per narrow body aircraft compared to traditional leather as well. Needless to say, such cuts are very enticing to any airline, particularly those low with low cost models. God, heaven forbid Ryanair shed any more weight. The seats are already like blocks of wood. <laughs> uh, while weight and subsequent fuel savings were big for Southwest, a lot of Waste would uh, typically be generated from significant undertakings to reupholster seats. In this case, however, the airline partnered with charity to transform the old seat material into shoes and footballs, uh, furthering its sustainability. While the words that begin with E, prefixed in today's increasingly modern world, may typically stand for eco or electronic, the E in E leather apparently stands for engineered leather. Indeed, according to the company's website, the main product, which stems from discarded leather scraps, is made by uniquely entangling leather fibres. And interestingly, this is done solely through the use of water. This makes waste product useful while being robust, lightweight. The firm promises that it reduces CO2 as well, only by as much as 55% recycled leather, which is used in its final products. The firm primarily develops products geared to the automotive and public transport sectors, but it also has its own line for the aviation market, known as the Flight Collection. This is how eLeather describes its product on its website. It says, unlike any other aviation textile, engineering leather, or engineered leather, looks better, lasts longer, and reduces weight, offering airlines significant fuel saving. <clears throat> The company also notes that engineered leather reduces the need for deep cleaning, thus lowering turnaround times between flights. So there we go. E-leather. Fancy, you? well, fancy it on the old Focus ST, Nev. Well, no. No. <laughs> did, I, did, did I mention that I used to... I hope he's not listening to the show. It'll be terrible if he is. But um, I used to work with someone. You, you know that uh, these seats that you see in aircraft are often not always but often manufactured by Recaro 
well, I have uh, Recaro seats in my Focus ST as well. Um, but this fella, uh, he had a, I think he had a Sierra Cosworth at one point. Ooh. But he, he was never very good with the words, and he always used to call them their Ricardo seats. Oh. And no matter how many times people corrected him, he, he just carried on saying that they were Ricardo seats. Oh, Ricardo. Um, uh, so, um, yeah. Uh, but in, let's go back to this. Uh, I was a bit of a tangent there. Um, well, of course, uh, saving weight and improving longevity is everything in aviation, isn't it? So, yeah. Just don't um, take any more foam out of the seats. Well, no, and, and certainly some of the ones that I've seen on EasyJet's fleet, uh, they look a bit narrow for my frame, I have to say, as well. Mm. I don't know what the Ryanair ones are like. I have to say, the, the, the one that we were on was an older one, wasn't it, Carlos? And uh, yeah. it had the older seats. But actually, they, they, they're they lasting well, actually. They're, they're not... Um, yeah, they're, they're they're sort of they're sort of holding firm. I think I, th I think they're actually doing surprisingly Very well. Firm. Well, yeah, but I mean, as in that it's not they're not as uncomfortable or as tired as you think they would be, and I think mm. that is because they have you know because it is a quality product, if you like, that that was on it in the first place. Um, not not easy to repair, I guess, if there is n nooks and tears and things. But um, yeah, now Nev. You've got uh, this next one here, haven't you, on the list? Yeah, this is quite an interesting story, actually. It's on the BBC website. Um, and, well, let's just get into it. Um, student Puya Umashanka clearly remembers when she first felt the roar of an aircraft taking off. She was 10 years old and travelling from Sri Lanka to the UK with her family. Through the window near her seat, she could see hundreds of tiny lights on the ground below. It's just a piece of metal, she remembers marvelling, and it's flying now. Well, today, a decade and a half later, she'd returned from Sri Lanka to study aircraft maintenance engineering at the University of South Wales. She says, I knew that I wanted to do something that nobody had ever done in my town, she said. Well, the aviation industry can't find enough people uh, like Puya, so for years, airlines and air engineering firms have struggled to hire maintenance engineers, and now there is a global shortage numbering in the tens of thousands. This is a huge problem, not least because aviation is expected to balloon in the coming decades, and industry estimates suggest that roughly 700,000 engineers will have to enter the profession between now and 2040 in order to satisfy demand. Plus, after Boeing's recent 737 MAX 9 door uh, plug blowout, uh, currently the subject of an investigation, of course, engineers have been in especially high demand to perform increased checks on 737 MAX aircraft of various models. Trade Association ADS says that there are 10,000 vacancies in total across the UK's aerospace, defence and, uh, sorry, defence, security and space industries. Puya, who's now nearing the end of her three-year degree, says she wants to be part of the solution. What motivates me is to help people travel, she says. I want to help them fly whilst being safe. She says that she has especially enjoyed working with electronics during her course, but was not able to find on-the-job training placement. However, uh, she uh, has now started applying for full-time positions. She hopes to work for an employer that will treat her with respect and provide further training. Not many of her colleagues will be women, she knows, but that does not deter her. There's such a shortage of female engineers in this field, I just feel that maybe I should be one of them. Well, redressing the severe gen gender imbalance in the industry could help tackle the shortage, some of observers said. In the UK, fewer than 10% of aerospace and aviation engineers are women. The numbers are now even worse across the Atlantic, says Gail Rusha, a former aircraft maintenance engineer, now at Western Michigan University. Only 2.8% of US aircraft technicians are women. Well, multiple engineering firms contacted by the BBC declined to specify whether they were short of aviation technicians at present or to what extent. However, AAR Corporation said that it raised salaries and launched a programme to help US military veterans 
join the workforce. More than 60 such candidates have been hired since 2019, the firm says. Uh, ST Engineering has started a mentorship program in Singapore and is in, t is in talks to set up a training academy in the US. Meanwhile, Lufthansa Technic is uh, working to attract more women into the industry. Large-scale recruitments of apprentices is still ongoing, uh, a spokeswoman added. Uh, the current focus on training is significant, says uh, Daniel Olufsen, who's a training director and principal consultant at Wing Engineering, which works in the aviation industry. It's partly down to the fact that fewer aircraft engineers these days are ex-military, and therefore not as many people with hands-on uh, experience are entering the maintenance roles, he said. Now, another key reason for the shortage is, is that the higher number of engineers are now in their 60s are retiring from the profession. And uh, aircraft maintenance is not as glamorous as it once was, suggests Robert Mann, who's an aviation uh, uh, in analyst in the industry and consultant at RW Mann and Company. Some of the benefits that came with working for an airline, uh, airline flying on staff passes, for example, just aren't there anymore. He stresses that a dearth of engineers is no excuse to cut corners on safety. This is not a test flying business, this is consumer business. Uh, Nadim uh, Bandali is an aircraft maintenance engineer at Gatwick Airport. He says that when young people ask him about the job, he shows them videos of the kind of work he does to illustrate how practical it is. It's purely mechanical, fixing aircraft, troubleshooting aircraft systems, he says. As an example, just a few weeks ago, he and his colleagues were tasked with locating a fault in a long sensor uh, that wire that runs through the fuselage and wings of an A320. It took a few hours, but they found it and fixed it. He is aware of the engineer shortage, but says, I don't think safety is an issue at the moment. Well, keeping planes in the air without incident is a worthwhile endeavour for Puya. Uh, aircraft, she says, connect the whole world into one. And, you know, we talk about the, the shortage of pilots sometimes, but mm. we rarely talk about this subject but again you know it's the boys and girls on on, on the ground and in the maintenance yeah. facilities that, that keep these aircraft flying and uh, we do need uh, more women into the industry no, no question about it yeah. i would say mm. do you know i think if Very i was younger I, I definitely think if i was younger and i was going to retrain i would i'd love to retrain to do something with engineering with aircraft mm. yeah obviously flying them is yeah. you know awesome but i that would be kind of an avenue that i'd like to go down as well if mm. i was 10 plus years younger than i currently am uh, 20 dear 20 yeah that as yeah. well <laughs> thanks matt thanks always for a pleasure uh, <laughs> so we've got uh, one last story in the commercial news segment for this week and uh, this one comes from nypost.com and that's that question, Nev. Have you ever asked yourself this question? What are those black triangles in aircraft, aircraft cabins? Do you know? I'm normally, I have normally got an eye for detail, but I do know I've never even noticed them before. But oh. we're going to find out all about them, I suspect. Yes. Yeah, so, a flight attendant for Philippines-based carrier Cebu Pacific is sharing the secret meaning uh, behind black triangle stickers in aircraft cabins. Passengers sitting next to the triangles get the best view of the wings, Henny Joyce Lim explained in a 2022 TikTok that resurfaced this week. The flight crew, if they need to check the wings, these triangles let them know the best vantage points for the slats and flaps outside. In the 30-second clip on TikTok, which has landed more than 304,000 views, Lim stands in an empty Airbus A320 as she advises passengers to look for the triangles in the cabin if they get to choose their own seat. Anyone who loves taking the window shots or videos will get the best view over the wing seats, she declared. TikTok commenters try to gauge the rows with the triangles from watching the video. Row 10 and row 18 got it one spied either 10 or 18 limb confirmed but it still depends on the type of aircraft or depending on the type of aircraft configuration she said i saw that it was uh, stated a uh, seated 29a and then a few seats from me i saw something like that at first i thought a fly had entered the aircraft another follower confessed when they saw the black triangle Retired aerospace engineer Lee Ballantyne weighed in on the Black Triangle's mystery on the Q&A website Cura in, back in 2015. He said the Black Triangle marks the location of what has been called 
ready for this? For those who are fans of Star Trek, the William Shatner seat, the seat with the clearest view of the wing. This uh, was the place inside the aircraft in which you can get the best visual check for ice or other problems, Valentine disclosed. The Shatner's reference is one of the strangest Twilight Zone episodes, Nightmare at 20,000 Feet. For those of you watching in YouTube, we'll be able to see the picture on the screen now, which first aired back in October 1963. In it, Shatner's see, uh, character sees a gremlin on the wing of the passenger plane that he is on. I don't know what that is, but that's not a gremlin. <laughs> Now, uh, producer Nick, uh, sort of basically while he was sat there, sorry, apologies, this is quite visual, so worth uh, jumping to this point on the uh, <laughs> uh, YouTube uh, uh, video if you want to take a look at this. So, uh, as I say, uh, Nick went down a bit of a rabbit hole with this one. Um, this is for our US listeners. So Indeed, yeah, absolutely. Uh, the, <laughs> <laughs> uh, this one I think is particularly scary. This is this is a, a, a terrifying uh, image. I, I think really. I don't know if you'd want to see that. Oh, uh, do you know what? We should have had this as a caption. This. <laughs> yeah, we we could st we could still. Uh, to be fair, uh, for me though, however, I think the one that's going to give me nightmares oh, the most oh is uh, uh, this one. I think this is going to haunt me for the rest of my life. Oh. Uh, <laughs> State of it. <laughs> I know what a terrible. T I mean, honestly, no wonder uh, William Shatner is extremely distressed. That's all I'm saying. Uh, oh, there you go. Any, any comments, Carlos, at all? Just out of interest. Well, I'm just surprised that the young lady there is sound asleep. <laughs> <coughs> Quite, absolutely, <clears throat> indeed. Oh my word! Okay, somebody get Honestly. us out of this. Out, Thanks for that, some, some, Nick. Somebody Thanks dig us that, out Nick. of this hole, will they, please? <laughs> right, we have got a very, very special part of the show next. Nev, what is coming up next? Well, you know our chum uh, Rory on air, and uh, it, it, all the, with all the rotary stuff that he's been mm -hmm. doing up in Aberdeen. Uh, well, I was in contact with him, with him uh, this week, so I noticed that you've got a new video posted out. And if you haven't seen it, I thought you might like to have a look at it. Um, and uh, obviously, uh, it's a quite a long video. It's a, nearly uh, 28 minutes long, but it's really worthwhile. Because in this special edition of Rory On Air, he goes behind the scenes with Scotland's charity Air Ambulance. Uh, he meets the crew based at Aberdeen Airport and finds out about the roles carried out by the pilot and the paramedics the kit they carry which could save your life and with cameras mounted on board the helicopter rory gets to travel with them on hems and air ambulance missions across scotland hello and welcome to a very special edition of rory on air where i've spent the last couple of days with the team here at scotland's charity air ambulance I'm fortunate to have been given unprecedented access to the goings-on at the Air Ambulance Base here at Aberdeen Airport and I'm really excited to share this video with you. We'll find out from the pilot about what the EC-135 helicopter is like to operate and the challenges of flying in Scotland. We'll hear from two of the paramedics about the kit they carry on board which could save your life and we'll get to ride along with the crew as they fly all over Scotland attending a range of HEMS and air ambulance tasks in some tricky weather conditions. First up though, every shift begins with a briefing. Hi right, morning all, so here's the uh, synopsis for this morning, uh, today, 22nd. So essentially we've got an unstable airflow coming through with a variety of troughs bringing a bit of weather through. It's not too bad on our side of the hills, uh, but there is obviously weather out to the west as those troughs come through. Into the afternoon, still decent picture, just a bit of cloud on the high tops, and then it's a good finish, so any night recoveries will be fine for getting into the ARI. Wick is fine, and Kirkwall, again, is fine. Just a few showers coming through, but 1,400 feet is the lowest cloud base today, so good on that. And then down towards Edinburgh, a little bit more mixed, but again, it's going to be workable throughout, just with a little bit more wind and the cloud base remains workable for most of the flying period there, 1,200 feet. So overall, decent day, lighter winds, just the freezing level much lower. So uh, my name's Pete, and I'm one of the two base pilots uh, based here at Aberdeen, flying on Scotland's charity air ambulance. Uh, we've also got a sister base down in Perth, which again has another two pilots uh, flying down there. 
the charity uses two Eurocopter 135 helicopters and this is the T2E version. For the air ambulance role they're really well suited actually. Uh, when we have a look inside in a second you see quite a small airframe that would fit all the equipment we need in for that life saving care the paramedics and the doctors give. But because it's quite a small footprint it means we can land in a huge variety of landing sites really which is really useful when we're trying to get into urban areas, into tight rural locations, landing on roads. So again that small footprint actually does work quite advantageously for us in many uh, circumstances. And from a pilot's point of view, what's the 135 like to fly? It's, it's not a type rating I have, I've never had a go at the controls of one. What's she like as a machine? Really, really nice helicopter to fly, really responsive, excellent for low level work. Again, really stable platform when you're flying on instruments in cloud. So again, in its role as an air ambulance helicopter, it's really well suited. I think it's a pilot's aircraft, again, really quite a pleasant aircraft to fly, very responsive uh, and very manoeuvrable. So yeah, great aircraft for this role. Now, I come from a, a current background of, of multi-crew. There's always two of us on board the aircraft that I fly, the S92. You're working single pilot, but you also have additional support from technical crew members on board. Tell me about that. What's it like being single pilot in these conditions and how much help are the paramedics able to give you? So my background's predominantly multi-pilot. So again, a bit of a, a step change uh, doing single pilot work on this aircraft. All the pilots are fully procedurally rated for flying in cloud and also conducting the kind of day VFR night missions. Because we're single pilot and the role that we undertake, we have uh, helicopter technical crew members, our paramedics are have an additional qualification to help me when we're flying around at those lower altitudes, reading checklists, helping with navigation, and probably most crucially, when we get to a landing site, they're helping me find somewhere suitable to land that uh, we can get to the patient quickly, that we're not gonna disturb anyone or cause any damage to anyone in the vicinity. So they're a crucial part of the team, and actually they're a legal requirement for us to have uh, when we're conducting those HEMS missions into unsurveyed sites. So yeah, really valuable and really good at offloading the pilot when we're in those busy work situations and when we're trying to find a landing site. Do me a favour and try and find Rimmel on there. When you get the sec. Yeah. I'd not been at the base very long, probably less than an hour when the first tasking of the day was called in. The weather conditions weren't great with rain, low cloud and a forecast for increasing winds. But undeterred, within minutes a plan had been formed and off they went. The following day, Pete talked me through their route. Uh, so we got tasked over to the, uh, the west coast of Scotland, uh, so all the way, uh, we're here in Aberdeen, and we got tasked all the way over to the west coast. So uh, as you saw here yesterday, and you'll see from the footage, obviously the, the cloud base was down at 500 feet, so not suitable for us to go across their VFR really, given the terrain and the obstructions uh, that we encounter on route. But we checked the weather uh, and we could see that obviously uh, Aberdeen is quite poor, Inverness and Lossy Mouth are much better because of the prevailing weather conditions. So the freezing level was such that allowed us to go IFR, so we conducted an IFR departure from Aberdeen, uh, essentially going to Inverness as our destination with Lossy Mouth as our diversion. Uh, and then knowing that we would uh, either brake cloud on route or we'd had the procedure set up for the uh, the ILS at Inverness. So we had that IFR option to get us towards Inverness. We knew we'd brake cloud uh, either by doing the approach or just descending with the procedure and then we continue VFR out to the west coast is what we did. So we put a lot more fuel in uh, the aircraft and that allowed us to have that IFR option and also the range to get across to the west coast, pick up the patient and then recover that patient to Regmore Hospital and then we go to Inverness for fuel. This is our uh, Airbox iPad app that we use to help us with the navigation uh, as we're flying around, so a moving map. Uh, so you can see I've retraced from Aberdeen across to Inverness and then into the mountains, uh, following on the valley routes down into the, the west coast where we uh, conducted our recce and then into the landing site itself. So again, these, these iPads are invaluable for allowing us to kind of navigate as we're flying uh, on our HEMS missions. It's been a very busy day for the crew and the aircraft today. I arrived just after nine o'clock this morning and we were doing a bit of a briefing and we've just managed to get some cameras in the aircraft um, and get that signed off by the engineer and then the bat phone went. They got a call, first off they were out to the west 
Uh, then they came back again uh, sort of mid-afternoon and uh, just as they were landing on the pad here outside the hangar they got another call with another job, uh, a high priority one as well. Uh, so they quickly refuelled and uh, restocked and went off again on their next mission which that time I think was up to Macduff on the northeast coast, so a bit closer but uh, another job nonetheless. So I haven't seen much of the crew uh, or the pilot today um, because I've been waiting for them to, to come back from their various jobs but great to see how busy the air ambulance is, how busy the charity are and, uh, you know, and the real impact that it's having on, on people's lives all over Scotland. Having used the playing fields at Macduff Primary School as a HEMS landing site and now with the patient on board, the team heads straight for the Aberdeen Royal Infirmary. The weather has improved considerably but by now it's dusk as they make their approach to the hospital helipad. By the time they've handed the patient over to staff, it's almost dark. From the back of the aircraft, one of the paramedics was able to film their departure from the ARI and the short four minute hop back to base. Still to come, we'll meet the two paramedics on duty today and see how they load a patient on board the aircraft. Plus, I'm able to sit in the cockpit for the daily engine wash and Pete shows me the instruments and navigation kit that's invaluable for their HEMS missions. It costs more than £5 million annually to keep this amazing life-saving service operational 365 days a year. While the paramedics that work on the helicopter are provided by the Scottish Ambulance Service, they're paid for by SCAR. If you'd like to make a donation to Scotland's charity Air Ambulance, visit scaa.org.uk where you'll find a donate button on the top of the homepage. I've also put a link in the video description too. I'm Claire and I'm one of the team lead paramedics at Helimed 79. I'm Keir, I'm one of the Air Ambulance paramedics on Helimed 79. So air ambulance is essentially collecting someone from a hospital based setting and taking them to another hospital. A HEMS is an emergency. So it's, we can land anywhere, not just at, not at a hospital, we can land in a field or anywhere that's suitable. So I think there's lots of parts of the job that I really enjoy. I think without stating the obvious, the flying is obviously one of the most interesting parts to the job and also the extra skills that you have to learn from the aviation and medical side. I think as well we're sent to really high acuity jobs which can be really interesting um, and makes you think a bit harder. Now as paramedics you're obviously there primarily for the care of patients but one of you sits up front next to the pilot and provides assistance to them. So tell me about the aviation side of the job. So this is the, the big thing for us as paramedics joining um, as an air ambulance paramedic because we were used to the medical side of the job whereas the aviation side is a whole new world to us and quite overwhelming when you first start. But the things that we help the pilot with are in navigation, um, communications, we're in extra eyes looking out the front of the cockpit which is the, the big thing, um, especially when we're flying to these unsurveyed HEMS landing sites um, and again just different aircraft safety things that we do as well. Now I can imagine this job is quite high pressured and intense at times, but what is it about it that you really enjoy the most? Obviously the team, we're all a good bunch, we all get on really well together, um, but obviously the flying, it's really good. The views that you get from the aircraft are amazing, all the different seasons, you've got different coloured land underneath you and different everywhere we go it's different office window every day isn't it? Yeah we're very lucky it's a very small team here so it's quite close it's like a little family really um, but it's a privilege to do the job that we that we do and every day is different and um, yeah it's a completely different world it's really good fun. So essentially here we have a patient who's in simulated cardiac arrest and what we're carrying out is advanced life support so we're breathing for the patient uh, we have the Lucas CPR device delivering chest compressions we have our monitor attached so we can analyse the electrical rhythm that the heart's in and deliver shocks if need be and uh, we have IV access that we can deliver drugs as well and the benefit of having Lucas is that we can do that whilst on the move um, so which makes it perfect for flying in the aircraft. Okay, yeah, is everyone ready? Yeah, ready? Okay, ready, set, lift. Stop. So you've got the patient in then, and you've got this front seat turned round so that both of you can yeah. work on the patient. How do you differentiate your roles at this stage? So I'd be 
dealing with airway at this point because I'm closest to the airway and Keir will be on monitoring and the CPR. So there's a checklist on the wall here which um, can keep us right and prompt us for certain things for a patient in cardiac arrest. And we have very distinct roles that Claire said. So she's in the perfect position to manage the patient's airway and deliver ventilations on the way to hospital, whereas I'm in the better position to monitor the patient and uh, use a CPR device and also give drugs if need be. Due to the salty sea air and the fact the aircraft regularly flies over water, washing the engines is a job that gets done every day to help keep them in tip-top condition. So we've done all the initial pre-flight checks and then the only if we're going IFR will we be do the IFR, pre-IFR checks really, just so we can get out as quickly as possible if yeah. the bell goes, so yeah. We also just confirm that the aircraft is serviceable and we go on the shift and we'll also do the morning wash, so especially with us being fairly close to the sea. Yeah. I think we can get it all done in a while in the morning and then we'll get to go. Yeah. Well, here we are in the cockpit of the 135 and Pete's going to talk me through. We've got the aircraft connected to ground power now so that we can have all the electronics on without flattening the aircraft battery. So what are we looking at here then? Just talk me through the 135 cockpit. So a quite nice uh, clean cockpit we've got on the 135. So we've got our primary flight displays for the left-hand seat and for my uh, side here. So attitude indicators, the kind of main central uh, display there with our airspeed on the left and our bar altimeter uh, on the right-hand side. Pressure subscale beneath. Uh, we've also got a vertical speed indicator which is integrated into that display. So it's a very easy scan when you're flying on instruments basically looking at what you have there. We can also bring up a heading tape underneath, so actually it makes it very uh, easy to fly on instruments. It's a very stable platform to do that. Below that then we've got our uh, HSI, uh, allowing us to have a variety of navigational information on there. At the moment we've got the VOR selected, one of our ground-based navigation aids nearby. But we can also have NMS, which displays GPS information, which is derived from my Garmin 750 displayed there. So at the moment we've got a steer to the Aberdeen Royal Infirmary, which is just over three and a half miles away. And then these screens in the middle here, uh, this one here, our caution advisory display, which looks at our fuel state within the aircraft, but also uh, some of the cautions that are associated with system malfunctions as we were flying around. And then over here, we've got this big clock looking uh, indication, which is our first limit indicator. That essentially combines information on torque, TOT and N1 speeds. And whichever is the limit that we reached first, that will be displayed on the needle. And so we've got a really easy reference to have a look as we're flying around at which parameter is our limiting factor so that we can pull an appropriate amount of power to fly around. And then below that, we've got indications on our engine oil, transmission, temperatures and pressures. And then these two big uh, nav screens down here, these are our Garmin 750s, really one of the easiest using navigational systems I've ever used. It has uh, replicated number one and number two sides. We've got our radios and our ground-based navigation aids. We've got a transponder built into there. We've got uh, information on terrain and warning systems for that and we've also got TCAS looking at traffic around so it's a really good integrated system all on one user-friendly box and it's very easy to manipulate it's almost like an iPad so great for single pilot flying around in poor weather allowing you to get lots of information very quickly and displaying that very clearly as well which is what we want when we're working in those poorer weather conditions at lower altitudes and then moving down all this stuff here is our radio boxes. We tend to fly with two air traffic radios. We've got two additional TAC radios, which we use all the time for talking to ambulance control. We also have a third radio we can talk to uh, search and rescue or any uh, mountain rescue teams on the ground. So we can have lots of different radios going at any one time. So we're just managing those within the crew to make sure A, we're listening to air traffic, but also listening to updates from the uh, at scene for any jobs as we go along. So at the front here, you can see these funny little uh, shoes. Uh, what they are, because we fly at quite low levels at times and we're landing at unsurveyed sites, the, the threat from flying into wires is such that we've got additional wire cut modifications on our aircraft. So this kind of shoe that you see at the front is designed to deflect wires if we were to fly into them underneath the aircraft. And then you see here we've got essentially a set of cutters which are, if it doesn't go underneath the aircraft, it's then going to cut the wire. We've got floats on the skids 
obviously you're flying over water quite a lot of the time. We do, uh, as you say, we go out to Kirkwall, uh, the Perth aircraft, we'll go out to the west, out to Barra and the Western Isles. So getting all our aircraft are fitted with floats, uh, should the worst happen, gives us the best chance of landing the aircraft safely on water and evacuating the aircraft. Likewise, we always fly with uh, uh, immersion suits if the water temperature requires it and we've got life jackets as well. And all our paramedics and pilots uh, undertake the, uh, the underwater escape trainer to allow them to give them the best chance if we were to uh, have to ditch for whatever reason. The dunker. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay, uh, next thing I noticed, Pete, is the teddy in the window, which yeah. I've seen in so many of the photographs of the aircraft. What's the story behind well, that? Well, it's probably the most important bit of the aircraft, really. Uh, it's for our younger patients that we fly if we're doing air ambulance missions, uh, taking children down to some of the children's hospitals down in the central belt or on longer air ambulance transfers, or if we're picking up a child for, from a traumatic hem scene, uh, we always give them a teddy bear. One, it's a, a way of taking their minds off what's happening at the time. So yeah, we always have a teddy bear on board should we need to give it to one of our younger passengers. Said, Man, can speak to then we'll essentially look to go Inverness and then from there probably up Ankershee in that direction and then through Clockton and then out to there. So we'll take a few of Clockton if we need to do a turn, otherwise we'll get on with that. Have a yeah. Got off the iPads, the yeah. task sheets, the yeah. tablets, printer, yeah. the rear radio, uh, that's yeah, the aircraft. Switch it on the talk um, we don't need the, we'll take the Lucas, don't need my pack, the security's on the way out. Cool, let's go. It's my second day with the team here in Aberdeen and they're off on another emergency tasking. If you're enjoying this video and you haven't already, please subscribe and hit the notification button so you're alerted when I upload new videos. Leave a comment too, I read them all and try to respond to as many as I can. Tell me about what it is about the role that you enjoy, what's exciting about it, what's enjoyable about it. Well, I think it's the variety of the work that we do, coupled with the benefits, the real world benefits you can see for people that we go out uh, and help. So for the flying point of view, uh, really varied flying. We get to fly in some amazing scenery here in Scotland, into the Cairngorms, out up to the islands uh, around Scotland. So again, that variety of landing sites that we go to, uh, again, is really quite nice. When it comes to the actual mission itself, the HEMS mission, landing in unsurveyed sites, Again, the variety of the places we go to just makes it quite a challenging, interesting and dynamic uh, role, really. A lot of the time we're blessed with quite good weather here in Aberdeen, I would say, because the hills seem to take quite a lot of the rain, but we also get periods of fog, we get periods of low cloud. Yesterday it was broken at 500 feet for quite a lot of the day. How do you kind of work out whether you can or cannot actually do a job? If we're doing an air ambulance job, we'll plan that as if we were doing commercial air transport because it is commercial air transport and we'll make sure that we've got a full flight plan with all the fuels etc worked out and submitted so that's much more procedurally planned uh, and in slower time when it comes to the HEMS mission obviously where the time pressure is a little bit greater so we tend to have uh, we know our range that we can go to with our pre-planned uh, and normal fuel states and depending on where the job is like yesterday it's on the far west coast of Scotland We'll then look at the where we're going to, we'll have a quick assessment of the fuel requirements and the weather, and then we'll either take additional fuel before we lift or we'll look to schedule a refuel en route. But it's, it's much more reactive, those kind of missions. So again, the planning cycle tends to be sped up a great deal because we try and get airborne within five minutes uh, of receiving the call so we can get out to those patients as quickly as possible. So, Again, you try and do the planning beforehand and you're constantly checking the weather and seeing what you might need so you're fully prepared. If the bell does go, you know roughly in your mind what you can achieve uh, and what additional fuel or planning you might need to uh, do before you go out to that mission. And the weather is constantly changing, as you've just said. What do you do in a situation where it's good enough to go on the job, you set off, you get halfway there or perhaps you even get to the job and you land on and then the weather situation changes and you can't get back or you can't continue what do you do at that stage because we 
our fuel that we can carry on this aircraft is relatively limited compared to the offshore aircraft. And we don't have an icing, uh, de-icing capability. Again, it's all about making those early calls, especially when you're flying the mountains and flying defensively. Uh, but if we are weathered in at scene, that's just something we have to deal with. Safety always comes first. So if we couldn't lift, if it's below our weather limits, again, unfortunately, the patient would have to go by another means, maybe search and rescue, maybe road ambulance. Uh, but again, the safety of the aircraft uh, takes priority in that. We may have to divert to another airfield that's closer to a major trauma centre, maybe Lossy Mouth or one of the smaller outlying airfields around Aberdeenshire, and then get a road crew to meet us. But again, they're the kind of decisions you just have to make as the, you're presented with the, the weather situation in front of you. One of the things I wanted to ask you about is the public and the public's relationship with the air ambulance and what you do. Now, what can they do to help? The obvious one is donate money, but what can they do to help? Well, uh, the fundraising that the people of Scotland do is absolutely amazing. We're a charity here, so again, fully funded by the people of Scotland. But on a, an aviation side, which I think you're alluding to, the public can really help us out. If they see us orbiting over a scene, it's generally because we're, we're going to land. We don't do training trips into those kind of areas. So if, if we're circling overhead, if they're in a park, we could just ask them to move to the sides or move away so that we can make a landing. Uh, that's probably the biggest thing they can help us out. And that just allows us to get the, the paramedics and the doctors as quickly as possible to those patients without us having to wait to try and find a suitable landing site if people are looking up at the helicopter. It's not every day you see a helicopter trying to land, but if you do, moving out of the way is going to be a big help to us. So aside from the threats of people being in the wrong place and the weather, what other things are you concerned about? What other things do you look out for threats-wise? So uh, for us, because we're flying much lower than other rotary aircraft based at Aberdeen, things that uh, such as birds, we have a lot of geese in northeast of Scotland, so we're always looking for those. We all fly with helmets, with visors, in case we were to have a bird strike. But from a kind of human bystander perspective, uh, drones, because they're becoming a lot more popular, people, obviously, it's very unusual to see a helicopter land, so they're always trying to film that. So if people do have drones and they see a helicopter, the biggest help they can give is to land that drone immediately. Uh, we've had occurrences recently of a drone getting fairly close to this air ambulance. So again, uh, because of that, we had to land further away from the casualty than we would have liked. So the biggest help is by getting your drone down and allowing us to land safely and as quickly as possible. Now, my family have a personal connection with uh, Scotland's charity air ambulance because my dad was actually airlifted off Alskerry last summer. I wasn't on the island at the time, but my brother Hamish was, and he filmed uh, some of the, uh, the movements of the aircraft and a little bit of an explanation as to what it was like for him when he was left on the island on his own. Dad had to be airlifted today by air ambulance into Kirkwall. Mum and I packed a bag for her and Dad to take in and had to say a rush goodbye and they got flown off um, into Kirkwall. The wind was blowing very strongly then, it's gone down now um, as was forecast. It was very strong gale force winds so I was suddenly left here for the first time in my whole life in nearly 27 years of growing up here and, and spending time here. I'm on my own on this island, there's no one else here but uh, how wonderful it is that it's the Scottish Charity Air Ambulance. What an amazing thing that is, that people's donated money and lottery funding and all those sorts of things that have meant that these paramedics who are based in Aberdeen and a pilot could come here to be so reassuring to Dad, to help us understand the problem, to put him in there in the helicopter and um, take him into Kirkwall where he's getting the right treatment and the right help just immensely grateful for that, just immensely grateful even with all the difficulties and all the remoteness of this place there are always still people that you can call upon and that is an amazing thing when you live somewhere so isolated, so remote, uh, makes a huge difference to life here, just unbelievable difference. So a big thank you from me personally and the rest of my family to the Air Ambulance for what they've done for us. I know lots of friends and, and people that I've met uh, who've been helped by the charity and, and the crews of the aircraft as well. And it's a fantastic resource that we have here in Scotland. There's so many rural, hard to reach places, island communities 
uh, places that are you know off difficult small roads in the highlands and uh, you know awkward to get to by road so to have the ability to get paramedics and doctors there by helicopter is absolutely fantastic and is something that um, rightly as a community and as a country we're proud of having that sounds to me like the job phone so I suspect they're going to be going off again any minute they're a busy bunch of people and it's been really really interesting and exciting for me to have spent the last couple of days here with them learning a bit more about what they do and uh, I really hope you've enjoyed this video so if you have please do like subscribe leave me a comment as well and of course the really big thing you can do is uh, make a charitable donation to Scotland's charity air ambulance there'll be a link and a description in the uh, the comments below in the YouTube description as well so please do that and thank you very much indeed for watching this edition of Rory on air and I'll see you next time thanks for watching all the way to the end here's some bonus blade slapping music to my ears cheerio wow 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 well, wow, 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 wow. He's done it again. Thank you very much, Rory, for allowing us to rebroadcast your latest video. Uh, it is an incredible insight into the work of the Scottish uh, Air Ambulance uh, Service, um, and it prompted a lot of discussion in the chat room, I can tell you. And just repeating what I said originally at the start, why is it that these are charitable organizations why are they not mm. fully funded by the governments um and you know i'm obviously delighted that people do donate to this and it's important they do um and i'm just uh, going to remind you of the website so it's uh, www.caa.org.uk and i can tell you that PTUK is about to make a a small donation to them mm. and i would encourage you to do so as well uh if you can possibly afford it but it just shows you doesn't it that the work that these these guys and girls do is mm. absolutely phenomenal and life-saving and uh, carlos has got some some stats which would be interesting to hear yeah thanks nev yeah we've got um, someone in the chat room did ask a minute ago about the cost and stuff involved in running the air ambulance so according to the air ambulance uk's uh, site the UK's air ambulances collectively make over 25,000 life-saving missions a year it, average cost of a mission for an air ambulance is two and a half thousand pounds per mission or to put it another way an annual cost okay here if you're sitting down for this an annual cost of more than 62 and a half million pounds the vast majority of which is funded by charitable donations by people like us and our glorious viewers mm. so there we go and it's, a, it's such a especially yeah. where we live it's such a vital service isn't it you know it, yeah, it still absolutely. still blows my mind that it's you know it's it's entirely run on charitable donations it's bizarre so if you've looked at this folks or listened to it if you're on the podcast uh, the downloadable podcast could you go to roryonair.com on the web uh, on facebook is rory on air instagram rory on air and on twitter slash x he is rory auskerry uh, a u s k e double -R, r y um and if you can like and subscribe to his videos he would really appreciate it but uh, uh the main thing here of course is donations so if you can afford a few quid um it's www.scaa.org.uk and that's scotland's charity air ambulance yeah and don't forget if you are a facebook person on the book of face uh, Facebook does that thing every year when it's your birthday. You can actually choose a charity to set up a kind of a fundraiser donation thing for your birthday. I do it every year uh, for the Air Ambulance, East Anglian Air Ambulance yeah. here, who are based at Norwich Airport. Um, and it's a great little way of raising, you know, a few hundred quid because, you know, as those figures point out, every pound helps to uh, keep the, the aircraft in the air and the staff there as well trained. So very important indeed so 
we've got time for the caption. This, just for fun, picture or cap picture of the week. This week's picture definitely sparked some interest when I posted it on our social medias uh, on the on the week or Monday, I think it was. I put it on there. I think in less than five minutes, there was six comments appeared on the um, Facebook page from people commenting on the picture. <laughs> now, <coughs> Nev. Uh, for the benefit of our audio viewers, what uh, is this week's picture um, concerning? Well, it's someone sitting on a window seat, in fact, an exit row, uh, which is uh, fantastic, which is where I like to be if I'm not in uh, one alpha. Uh, however, um, uh, just for safety reasons, uh, this fella has a helmet on and what looks like a backpack or a parachute parachute probably, yes uh, i would say uh so there's, there's reasons for that i'm sure and we were not short of uh comments from our dear listeners no Let's kicking off proceedings on. tonight graham haley he's in the chat room came up with new mandatory safety equipment issued by boeing for exit row passengers <laughs> excellent <laughs> Uh, John John Luke says today we are playing Boeing door plug roulette. <laughs> Dirk was saying uh, new TikTok challenge uh, shoot roulette. The jumper doesn't get to see the location nor the altitude until the door is open. Some also call it uh, Matt roulette. Hey, <laughs> excuse me. Uh, 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 Darren Smith says. Uh, Headwear being issued for uh, by LATAM for passengers on its 787s just in case the pilots are served coffee. <laughs> Honestly. Uh, Richard Flagg from UK Airfields. Uh, max protection for Alaska air passengers. <laughs> uh, Emphasis uh, on the max. Indeed, yes. Bernard uh, has been in touch. He said, if it ain't Boeing, I ain't going out the door. <laughs> Uh, Richard Leach says Ryanair's engineers required to carry out mandatory inspections on emergency exits during flights due to lack of ground time. True, true. Always a concern. <laughs> uh, John Falk says the Securicor cash delivery man takes no chances on his flight first flight to Colombia. <laughs> Uh, that tickled me, that one. Mazus has one. been in touch saying a young Darth Vader sets off on his gap year. <laughs> <laughs> and Daniel uh, says the only way for Matt Smith to don a parachute will be Ryanair. Oh, yeah. And there's a bit of, uh, bit of chat room action, Ooh, yes, of course. Uh, let, let's have a quick look. Uh, excellent one from Neil Lanwarn uh, here. <laughs> In a Boeing, um, any row is an exit row. Yes, very true. <laughs> Anything else? Uh, Aaron Richard P Adams. says, I thought this was supposed to be open. Lovely. <laughs> Richard Adams is saying, uh, Fred refused to pay the extra door bolt levy. Yeah, that seems sensible. <laughs> and, uh, excellent one from Dirk S coming up. <laughs> Airlines ah. now are also offering fast lane but disembarking. I think that could catch on, you know. Oh, Nev, Nev, you've got to read Captain Cruise's one out. That is a classic. <laughs> uh, I can't actually see that. Oh, yes. Uh, D.B. Cooper sighted in seat 22 Alpha. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. Oh, dear, 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 I like dear, that dear, one. Dear, dear. Good one, Captain Cruise. So, oh, yeah. big wow. thanks to everyone who's contributed uh, to this week's uh, caption, this picture. Very well done indeed. Uh, definitely tickled us there this week. Don't forget to keep your eyes on our Facebook page for next week's picture, which I'm yet to discover online. I'm oh. going to try and find a suitable picture. There's no shortage of stuff, though, is there? There's, there's yeah. plenty of uh, uh, comedy items to, uh, for us to enjoy. Yeah. Absolutely. But yeah, look out for that on our socials next week. And uh, you too could uh, have be. Uh, commenting on a funny picture indeed so we've got uh, some another interview coming up in just a moment from the drone summit but first it's time to take another look this week at a retro commercial break so two years in new york and he thinks he can tell us how to run things well we won't have it it's all right i fix things he's traveling overnight on the red eye you have no choice. Not first class. Of course not. Company policy. By the time he gets in, he'll be exhausted. 
And he won't have had time to incorporate those new figures I sent him in his report. He'll be hungry and tired. I've arranged for the chauffeur to bring him straight here, not to the hotel. Like a lamb to the slaughter, gentlemen. Morning. New Club World delivers the businessman ready to do business. Pleasant trip. Yes, thank you. New Club World from the world's favourite airline. What do you think of that then, Nev? <laughs> That's me before I put on a bit of weight. <laughs> I would say. <laughs> ah, indeed. Uh, that, I mean, I, I definitely remember that advert. I, I, I have very fond memories of that advert. I think it's probably one of the first sort of a- aviation sort of adverts I think I saw. Uh, now, I, and I don't mean this in any rude way, shape or form, Nev, but do, I mean, do you remember that particular livery and stuff? Were you flying sort of back then? Oh, yes, very much so, yes. Uh, the, the Landor livery there, so uh, I was flying on the uh, 757s, uh, backwards and forwards to Edinburgh, Belfast, Glasgow, uh, etc. So on, on the shuttle routes, uh, yeah, very much so. And on the 76s as well. Um, mm. So, uh, no, great stuff. <laughs> they were really good adverts back then. I'm not sure that they could run some of these today. I mean, <laughs> judging by the la- one from last week, mm. uh, that was um, that was not 2024 material, was it? No, yeah, sure. no not, not, not 2024 friendly. <laughs> yeah, no, no. So I hope you're enjoying our little retro commercial aviation. We're going to run one each week on the show. We've got a little... Uh, Until you run out, a, basically. A vault. We've got a little vault. <laughs> oh, have we? Videos, oh, say. Uh, on, our, on our PTUK server that we can dip into with yeah. adverts. We'll run one each week on the show because they are interesting. Mm-hmm. As we, we were just saying there while that was running, it is quite an, a nice little piece of the show, I think, which is... Um, going to be popular i think with Com- the listeners. completely away from aviation by the way nev you well you might uh, to be carlos to be fair carlos you might remember it as well do you remember do you remember the the, the ad where it went um um whereabouts did you bury the car kevin in the sand oh my word that was um <laughs> early night was it early 90s no it was 80s it was, was, it, 80s, was it 80s yeah 86 yeah yeah Oh, yeah, God, he's a, he was a very nice man, a very very nice man. Yeah, he was a nice man. Yeah, very nice man. Adverts were so much better back in the yeah, uh, indeed. 80s. Well, I think, uh, well, I, I suppose because it was a bit of a captive audience, wasn't it? Because you didn't have all these other mediums at which you could uh, sort of mm. put your adverts out on, could you? So it was all sort of you know, uh, you know, vi- visual adverts were made exclusively for the telly. Yeah, because uh, they aren't anymore, are they? Yeah. Not at all. No, Nev. What is coming up next on the show? Oh, lots more stuff. Sorry, I was just uh, uh, distracted by... I just realised we haven't sorted out the, the quiz uh, answers, oh. but I, I'm oh. sorting that out we'll at the it. moment. We'll do it so, next. But, uh, but uh, uh, maybe perhaps do that next week, actually, because we've got so much to cram in okay. uh, this week. So, But, of course, uh, as you know, we were at the recent Drone Summit in Dublin, Dublin, and Carlos got the opportunity to speak with Shane O'Leary of Munster Drone Services. Well, Shane's company was established in 2016, having started out as a hobby uh, by him uh, and Dennis. It quickly turned into a full-time business as the demand for both services and drone sales grew rapidly and they have enjoyed continuous growth since. Uh, Their pilots are all EASA-approved operators to carry out professional aerial works anywhere in Ireland and across Europe. They've got public liability insurance of 6.5 million euro and cater for one-off projects to large-scale national projects. They are DGI retailers for both consumer and enterprise drones and drone hire and repairs are also amongst the services they offer. They pride themselves in providing unrivaled customer service to all their clients and if you need a battery or just a team of people to cover your project needs, Monster Drone Services are there to help. So let's go over to uh, the RDS at Dublin and where Carlos is talking to Shane. So I'm here with Shane O'Leary and uh, we're on the the stand here looking at some rather, rather interesting looking uh, drones, I would say. Uh, Shane, welcome onto the show. Thank you very much. Good to meet you. So Shane, tell us a bit about uh, Munster then. What do you do with Munster? So um, Munster Drone Services was founded in 2016 and we started off as just a a general service provider doing work for real estate agents and just events and stuff like that. But um, uh, yeah, I suppose from 2018, 19 onwards, we kind of shifted into the asset inspection space 
Um, so we would have started off with some wind turbine blade inspections um, and we developed our kind of our um, inspection services that we offered over the last number of years to the likes of Confined Space, uh, where we would do, you know, um, cargo tanks and ships, you know, unsafe buildings, um, confined spaces of any description, inaccessible heights and stuff like that. So um, that's our kind of our service element. We do also do um, solar farm inspections and surveys, um, you know, construction sites, uh, uh, new developments, roads, or you know, any any sort of kind of infrastructure assets. We we do a lot of a lot of that. Um, we also have um, a range of DJI products that we offer to clients from right from the Mini 4 up to the M350. Um, and I suppose, you know, we're, we're in the motto of, you know, finding the, I suppose, if you have a problem, you come to us. And we, are, we do our very, very best to, you know, find the right solution for the client, whether it's hardware, software, or whatever. So um, we have a, a repair service, a rental service. So no matter what your drone requirements are, we, we pretty much have it to offer. Uh, we, have a team, we have a great team of six or seven staff, like so, you know, um, so it's going all the time, which is great. So on the desk here in front of us, we've got some a sort of range of DJIs on offer here that you, that you have. Uh, but obviously, we've got one here on the table right here, which is slightly different with, uh, if you can explain to the listeners, kind of what this drone is for, obviously this cage, and what, what does that uh, do for the drone? Yeah, so um, as I mentioned, it's, it's for confined spaces. Um, so we had a project last week where we had a culvert inspection. So we sent the drone down into the culvert and, uh, you know, the company that we were doing this work for um, tried many different ways to get this culvert inspected through robots, through crawlers, and they failed. Um, so then they, I suppose, called us to see, you know, would this drone um, be able to help them in this situation? And yes, it did help them. Um, so they found out that, they, you know, that there was an issue with the culvert. Um, and uh, so then they were able from that footage then to pretty much identify the works that needed to be completed and I suppose you know um, you know the tender when they were going to tender they knew exactly what they were putting tender you know saving you know huge amounts of money I would say in you know um, because they were going into many unknown situations before not knowing what they were facing into so um, that's what we use it for and um, we also use it for internal uh, blade inspections and wind turbines um, you know, uh, unsafe buildings, um, and I suppose what's unique about this drone is you can fly in non-GPS locations, so it has a LiDAR module on it, and what that LiDAR module is basically replacing your GPS on your traditional drones. So if you fly into an asset or a confined space, the LiDAR stabilises the drone and keeps it steady in the confined space. Um, it also has a, a lighting system on it, you know, so um, no matter how dark it is, you know, we can, we can go in there, there's oblique lighting on it, so we can turn on lighting in one direction to identify cracks or defects or whatever, whatever we're looking for. Um, so yeah, that's, that's a unique piece of kit, um, we invested in it last year, um, and it's been a great investment, which we, we found uh, I've got to ask, um, Shane, how easy is it to control one of these in a confined space? Obviously you've got, you've got your control unit, which most people are you know, accustomed to with controlling DJIs and that. But do you, do you have a lot of VR unit, or is there a special way you control this in confined areas? Because I, I'd be afraid of hitting the sides and... Yeah. yeah, I suppose Flyability have done a very, very good job on that. They've made it very, very user-friendly. Um, I suppose the big thing with confined space is spatial awareness and understanding where you are. But again, Flyability have done a superb job on that. What they've done is they've all uh, uh, formed up from that LiDAR unit, you get a point cloud model. So that point cloud model basically would reference your video footage to the point cloud. Um, so yeah, that's been brilliant. Um, and it, um, it's actually very, very user friendly. So if you fly into an asset and you get lost in there, you can just quit very quickly with your point cloud model and follow the route back where you flew in. Um, there's also a return to home function on it, which is very, very unique. Um, and it would fly back the exact route that you flew in. So if you run into trouble, you get that button or it will come back. So Flyability have done a very, very, very good job on that. Um, obviously, there's a price to pay for that, but 
It's dare I ask? <laughs> roughly ballpoint. Um, you'd be looking looking at sixty thousand plus for for something like that, you know. So that <laughs> that that's the cost of it. But look, you know, um, it gets a lot of people out of a lot of situations. So you know, that's really what what the cost of it is. So other things you do, obviously you've got the, the wind turbine inspections, which is quite a big, obviously over in our side, our neck of the woods in the UK, we're surrounded by a lot of wind farms and stuff. Um, are you using kind of things like this or using the, the larger one that you've got over there for that kind of job? Yeah, so for wind turbines, we generally use something like the M350 um, with a P1 camera. Um, the reason we use that is it has a good flight time of 55 minutes, um, you know, realistically about 40 minutes, but we need about half an hour to complete an inspection so we can you know we can definitely get it done in one flight and um, also I suppose there's a safety a lot of safety by using something like an M350 because you can put on a 50 mil lens and you can fly much further away from the blade as opposed to using a Mavic 3 or something where you know you'd have to fly much closer um, and you're getting full resolution images off of something like a, a P1 camera off a Mavic 3 if you zoomed you'd lose resolution and you zoom so um, that's the reason we use an M350. It's also much more efficient, you know, in, in the flight, can handle a lot more wind. Um, you know, it's just an industrial drone. It's designed for the job. It's, the, it's designed for doing large volume um, inspections, in, you know, and that's really, I suppose, I suppose that's a matter of us. We try and use, we always do, we use the right tool for the job, you know, rather than just having one drone and, you know, use it for every job. Which is not the case. With the wind turbines, are you, are you checking like the, the tower and the actual blades all the way along the blades? And yeah, so with the wind turbines, we do uh, generally blade inspections. So we would um, do four passes of the blade. Then I suppose what, the, what happens then is we process all that data through AI machine learning through some partners that we work with. And um, pretty much what happens then after that is. The customer, the end customer, will get a report on a, based on the findings and um, the severity of the defects and so on. So, depending on the client's requirements, as I said earlier, we tailor our products and services to what what they require. So, you know, no matter what the problem is, what the situation is, we will always try and come to a solution. Train and wise, Shane. How long does it take? I mean, obviously, I'm guessing that the people who come into you to, to work to do this kind of job, they have to have kind of a background knowledge of drones, but train them wise to fly something like, like this or the larger one there, is, it, is there a long process for that? Is it quite easy? Yeah, I suppose uh, what I say about, um, about getting people trained up, um, it's, not, it's, it's a new industry, so there's not people out there that have 20 years experience, you know. Um, so yes, it does take time, but those people with experience are starting to come true. I suppose all the people we have in the company um, came from many different backgrounds, such as motor trade or, you know, electrical or, you know, um, different things like that. So, um, Noel, who's working with us lately, he is the first person we actually have from the drone industry. Um, and we found it, we found it, um, found a huge benefit having someone like that. Um, but yeah, generally it takes, you know, it could take anywhere from six months to a year, depending on what we're doing, um, you know, to get someone trained up. Um, but look, dim, time, dim timelines are going to come down. Um, you have some uh, universities now um, have courses going, like uh, TUS in Limerick, Jonathan Blackmore, he's running uh, drones and construction. You know, so once we start to see these courses coming on stream, I would hope it would, it would come, become easier for an employer um, trying to recruit those people, you know. But yeah, that has been a huge challenge. Challenge, yeah. yeah. Um, so lastly, Shane, honest, uh, the quick question here. Out of all these, obviously you've got the DJIs here, the small, the minis in the air, and obviously the larger ones here. What's your favourite to fly, personally? That's a difficult question. Um, I actually have a, a, a bit of a, a sweet spot for the M30T. I don't know why. <laughs> It's just such a great drone. Um, I love the alias too. I love challenging work, um, and that's what we're always looking for: is something challenging. Um, and that if we can satisfy a customer, you know, that has a huge problem. That's what we do. But you know, the alias and the M30 are probably up there. But I, I pretty much give anything a go. 
And for the benefit of the listeners uh, watching the show, where can they find out more about what you do? Um, so we're on all social media platforms from Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, LinkedIn. We're very strong on LinkedIn. Um, and I suppose on our website, um, MonsterDroneServices.com. Um, we also have a show in Mill Street, County Park. So, um, we, uh, people are welcome to visit us anytime. Um, and yeah, so we'll be at some events like this. You know, we're going to the Wind Energy Confer uh, Trade Show in October. So we try and attend a couple of events a year. So and to maximise exposure. And you've seen our vans on the road as well. Yeah. You know, hopefully, hope that's where you can find out about it. I'll keep my eyes open when I'm when I'm back home in the UK in case I see you there. Yeah. Yeah, we'll be yeah. starting down in Exeter in the next couple of weeks, so we might see it. Excellent. Well, Shane, thanks for your time. It's been great to see you on, on the Good show future. and have you on the show and chat to you. Very interesting indeed what you do. And uh, yeah, all the best for the future. Yeah, and thank you very much. Thank you. Oh, that was a very clean van, wasn't it, Carlos? <laughs> It was a very, I was very impressed with the you had fan envy there, didn't you? Did, you? With absolutely. the cleanliness of Shane's van, it was very, very clean indeed. Yeah. But no, it was really great to speak to Shane. And uh, also, they did, as uh, we were saying earlier, they had some very nice uh, DJI drones available for sale there. And it, God, it took me, it took the will of <laughs> the will of divorce not to. Um, Put my credit I, think, card. I think the word you're looking for there is the threat of divorce, not threat the of divorce. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, to not purchase one of those. Yeah. Um, and as like Nev was saying, that Nev, that um, the bit, the large one with the cage round, that was mm. sort of the price of a small um, kid. Oh yeah, and the control unit for it as well. Yeah. Uh, absolutely yeah. brilliant. But, I, sh uh, I should say the DJ what G D D J I ones are nowhere near that. You know, you, you, you and they're can still get good. Very, you can get a really decent one for sort of under three hundred yeah. pounds these days. Yeah, mm. yeah we, it's we, good. We we did we have been uh, practice flying my drone, haven't we, Carlos? But we were having a few problems when we attempting. were uh, attempting to. But we but we will do that before before we these before these yeah. are all done. We will have some footage of Carlos flying a drone. He's Matt, refusing Matt. to fly it at the moment, and it's God. just like what he doesn't realise is it flies itself. My one, my one's one of the really simple ones. So yeah, it's going to be Matt, it's gonna Matt be is going to do some inspections of the roof of my warehouse. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. I'm just going to oh. check check the. Uh, build quality of the shelving and things like that you know absolutely very good yeah yeah Gosh. i've got to try and work out with my control i've got a bit of a problem because i so I, when i came home carlos I, I did get it flying but i've got a bit of a problem when it's hovering uh it's shifting to the left for some oh, you reason need to tr you've got a trimmer yeah, yeah i know kind of but i can't trim. work out how to do it on that particular controller so i'm gonna have to go back to reading the blood your best friend yeah well YouTube. Uh, 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 yeah okay yeah type, fair type the model that model name into youtube and there'll be a million videos on there of someone showing you how to do yeah. things now somebody was asking me what my drone was and uh it is a Bugs B5W is the uh, drone that I have. It's a Bugs B5W. It's got a very nice little 1080p camera. We we got it all sort of like fired up, didn't we? And and we got it like spinning and I all mean, that. I mean, the lights kind of flashed. Yeah, yeah, the lights brilliant. looked very lovely. Absolutely. And yeah. I've worked out because you you have to like uh, because it sort of flies itself. You have to um, calibrate Orient. the compass. You have to calibrate yes. the compass. And uh, when I got home and, and watched said YouTube video that uh, Carlos is talking about, I realised I was um, <laughs> I was doing it wrong, basically. So, uh, yes, never mind. Cutting so, stuff is terrible. I know. Right, so we're going to start to wrap up the show. But before we go, the 500th, we were discussing this earlier on before we went live. Those of you, those of you in the chat room earlier on will have heard us. But... Uh, we are obviously having our 500th show coming up very soon. It's going to be on the 1st of May. Now, as you know, we've done some recording uh, for our 500th, a very, very special recording, because uh, we're not having a large meet-up for our 500th this uh, time round. Uh, but we had a really good day a few weeks back, and we've done some great recording uh, with Armando and the team as well, and that's all going to be coming up uh, on the 500th show, along with an invitation from all of us here uh, that if you want to join us, yes, if you, the listener, would like to join me, Nev, Matt, Armando, and all the team here on Wednesday, the 1st of May, so that's Wednesday, the 1st of May, on the Zoom call, so as in you will be part of the live show, not just in the chat room, you'll be an actual, how do we put this, a, a guest host on the show as to say. Uh, send us an email, details coming up in a moment, uh, but we'd love you to uh, join us for that live show on the 1st of May. It's going to be a Wednesday, don't forget, 7 o'clock. 
uh, and uh, we'll convene on Zoom because we use Zoom. So if you don't have Zoom, just put it install it. Any tech issues, I'm sure Matt or Nev will help you out with that. Uh, but also those of you who can't make that day on the 1st of May to join us for the Zoom call, if you want to send us in any special messages, we would love to hear from you. So if you want to send us some voice messages, uh, that would be brilliant through our email or through our WhatsApp number. Matt, I need to sort that out because having a new phone, I had to obviously reinstall that. I didn't know that. you got a new phone. Yes, I have. Ah. I did tell you last week, honestly. But anyway, if you want to send us some voice feedback, we would love to hear from you. So send us your feedback in uh, to us for our 500th. And we'll play that out on the show as well. Uh, kind of questions that uh, Nick has posed here for you guys and girls out there is, how did you find out about us? Oh, I don't know. Uh, what do you like about the show? What you don't like about the show? Ooh, controversial. How long have you been listening to us? That's quite an interesting one, actually. We'd like to hear that. And uh, also your aviation backstory. So what you've been doing. No, it's not an iPhone, Bill, before you... I can see that in the chat room <laughs> in the corner of my eye. Um, so, yeah, we'd love to hear from you. If you want to join us for the 500th on the 1st of May at 7 o'clock and join in the actual live show, as in be part of the live show, uh, just send us your details on uh, an email and details coming up for that uh, very, very shortly indeed. But, yeah, it should, should be a good uh, good laugh, eh, Nev? Very much so, yes. Looking yeah. forward to that. Uh, we've got one more thing to finish, a bit of housekeeping to finish uh, before the end of the show, and that's the answer to the quiz question Ooh. from last week. Well, the question was, we, well, most of us know that the extra long-range capability of the A321 Airbus is called the A321 XLR. However, in the audio world, we know the XLR as a connector that's often used for microphones and all sorts of other connectivity as well as power as well. Well, but in audio terms, what does XLR stand for? Now, there are a couple of different answers to this, but the most popular answer is external line return. And the XLR is sometimes referred to as simply as an audio connector, but this circular connector with a long cylindrical metal housing was first introduced by the Canon Electric Company, which is now ITT Canon, in the 1950s as the XL series audio connector. It's very often used as a, a balanced uh, connector for long microphone cables, a three-pin connector, a four-pin connector can be used for power, and then five-pin connectors can be used for DMX 5 too, and that's a, a protocol that uh, lighting folks use uh, to control the, the movable lights, the very lights, all that kind of stuff. So lots of different versions of that. But uh, what I have done, just in the sake of fairness, I have put all of the uh, correct answers and the slightly dubious answers as well, <laughs> all in the hat together. Uh, before I draw it out, by the way, this is what we're going to be um, giving away as a prize. It's called a broken propeller, um, and it says it's Baz Bagby and America's first transcontinental, transcontinental air race. And that's very kindly been donated by Sam, one of our listeners. So thank you very much indeed, Sam. So we shall post that off tomorrow. But who are we going to send it to? Let's go through the London Biggin Hill hat and let's see who we draw out. Quite a few uh, answers in there, I must say. Let's have a quick look. And the answer is, or oh, so the, the winner is Martin Kemp. So, well done, Martin. I shall send you an email shortly. Just, just hold that a little and... closer to the camera, if you wouldn't mind. Oh, it's, it's, it's disappearing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, right, there we go. Can you see that right? Yes, That's there Martin. we go. Look at that. Lovely. Thank Martin you. Martin Kemp. Um, and uh, we shall... I shall send you an email shortly, Martin. And if you send us your address, we will send the book to you in the post. Thank you very much, Neve, for taking part. I uh, haven't got another quiz this week because it's a bit short of time, but we shall put one together for next week. Absolutely. Yes, yes, indeed. So details on where to send your feedback for the 500th and also to accept our invitation to join us on the Zoom call. So Facebook, Twitter, 
Instagram, search our social media uh, for Plain Talking UK. Uh, that WhatsApp number is plus four four seven five seven two two four nine one six six. Uh, you can email the show. It's podcast at plain talking uk dot com. And you can also find more about the team on our website. It's all the W's dot plain talking UK dot com. On there you'll find the details for uh, not only us as a team, but there's also a store on there where you can purchase yourself a PTUK T shirt. Uh, you can also grab yourself one of our very fine uh PTUK mugs and also a military grey mug as well if you if you're that way inclined uh, you can also find the links on there to Patreon and PayPal don't say it like that it makes it sound like it's some form of disease <laughs> <laughs> Nev's, Nev's there rolling his hands uh, you can find the links on there to Patreon and PayPal if you want to become uh, a donator to the show and help us uh, pushing the show forward each week as we do getting the great content that we do for the show so thank you to everyone who does donate to the show Patreon Patreon and PayPal, very much appreciated indeed. And uh, yeah, that is about it for the show this week. Quick round, Robin. Nev, what are you up to next week? Oh, uh, it's Easter coming up, isn't it? So we've got some days off, which is a nice change. So we're off on Good Friday and Easter Monday. And on Saturday, Mrs. Nev and I are flying to Belfast, uh, going back to the Titanic Museum. Uh, some new AV been done there with by one of our customers. So we're going to have a look at that. Uh, and then a minor dinner in the Hilton uh, in the evening. So we just go over there for the Saturday and Sunday, then uh, back on Sunday afternoon. So looking forward to that very much. Mr. Smith? Um, yeah, well, I'm, I'm off work for a few days, so this is very exciting. Uh, uh, I have my first day off today, um, and I don't go back till Tuesday. Um, so I was doing some training over at the radio station for a new person who's going to be broadcasting for Park Radio very soon. And then tomorrow I'm building a NAS drive for someone, and then um, I think hopefully going out for a meal with friends, then... Friday, hopefully me and Mum are going to go off to Bressingham for the day. We're going to go to the Ooh, Bressingham nice. Steam Museum and go and have a day out there, see what that's like. Um, Saturday, I think I'm uh, meeting my friend Jono. Um, yeah, it's just a, it's just a sort of like sort of five six days of of you know be, being pretending I'm retired. I think basically, <laughs> which will be lovely. I'm, I've started out already, Matt. Yeah, you yeah, could, yeah, yeah. I'll I'll bet, yeah. That. yeah. Yes, I shall be, well, I shall be having a busy, very, very busy Easter weekend, not just being on the radio for three yeah, outings, but also for, that. Thank uh, you. For, uh, for little visitations by various people and lots of food's going to be eaten and Lovely. drinks going to be drunk. So Indeed. enjoying our Easter. But that is it for tonight's show. Big thanks to all the chat room. Thanks to everyone who has listened to us tonight, viewers in the chat room. Great, you lot. You are awesome. Also, thanks to all the audio downloaders of the show as well. You are all legends. So have a great Easter holiday for those of you who haven't got to go into work on Friday and Monday. Enjoy yourselves, and we'll see you all again back here next Wednesday at 7 o'clock. Say goodbye, Nev. Uh, goodbye, Nev. Have a good one. Take care. Excellent.
Yes, Mima. <laughs> Mima's, yes, Mima's still we there. Have, we have finished. Yes, well done, Mima. <laughs> I could, I, I'll, I could try and pick her up. I don't think, I don't think we'll. No, blimey, she'll, she'll not be oh, impressed. No, she's, uh, she's going to tear me a new one. I think. Hang on, let's, uh, let's give it a go. She's, she's quite unimpressed. There we go. Hello, Tallinn. Hello, hello, old friend. There you go. She said, "What's this? Where, where's my, where's my light? Where's my camera?" She says. <laughs> Say hello, my ma. I know. Hello. There you go. Mm, you are very sweet. Go on then, down you go. There you go. You can get there you go. Okay. She's lovely, isn't she? She is. She really is. She's almost like a Maine Coon yeah. with her markings and that. She's, she is, absolutely. Yeah. As Travis, we're, we're not, because we're quite old now, we're not very good about looking after ourselves. So no. We, so we've got, we've got a little bit of, um, you know, we've got a little bit of knotting and things underneath, bless her, which, oh, hello, don't forget to do, oh yes, of course, thank you, Nev. Indeed, yes. Yes, so don't forget to donate, if you're able, to the Scottish Charity Air Ambulance, uh, www.scaa.org.uk. And I know they and Rory and the team would very much appreciate it. Thank you very much. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, I think yes. that's pretty much everything. It certainly is. A rather busy show tonight. Indeed, I know. Carlos, Carlos is amusing himself with filters, by the way. I don't know if you noticed, no? <laughs> yes. I, I, I'm just making up for what Nev would normally do. <laughs> actually, I tell you what, there, there's some new ones on Zoom. I haven't uh -oh. actually looked at them all. I mean, they're very good, I have to say. That they're they're not bad at all. Um, it's not suitable for business meetings, though. That's the only thing I would say. <laughs> no? Oh, OK. Uh, oh, I tell you what we have got coming up. Um, yeah. Whether it'll be edited in time for next week's show or not, I don't know. But uh, one of my uh, industry colleagues I found out uh, last week went on his first ever flight, or at least one of his uh, only flights he's done in recent years, to Jersey from oh. Heathrow. He's not done a flight for 44 years. Wow. <laughs> because he wasn't mad keen on flying. So I thought, what a great opportunity to have a chat with him. So we're going to do an interview pre-recorded uh, next week. And if I can get it out the, the can in time, we'll uh, broadcast it on, uh, on Wednesday's show. Sounds amazing. So, uh, which probably means we won't have time for the military again. So that'll be a oh, no. <laughs> tragedy, won't it? So. <laughs> oh, here, here come the emails. Uh, I'm, only jo I'm only joking, partially. Uh, so, oh dear, yeah, yeah partially. Oh, Betty. Yes, indeed. <laughs> Fortunately, we can't see you. Please keep talking, Nev, so that it doesn't come back. <laughs> oh, so Betty. No, 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 come on, don't roll round. There we go, it's staying there. Thank goodness for that. Yeah. Oh, stay. there it is. State of that, honestly. Oh. Uh, Frank Spencer, wasn't it? Yeah. Oh, yes. Anyway, uh, on that bombshell, I think we should say goodnight. <laughs> yes, we should. It's, there's no good being silly like this, gents. Honestly. We're here to do I, a professional I, I, show. Absolutely, we're trying to be professional, but we've we failed. Professional. I, I, I literally people. don't know what to say. I really don't. Uh, Nev, uh, please, can we can we have the last words from you, please? <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you very much, everybody, for joining us. Seeming really enjoyed everybody in the chat room. Very busy chat room tonight as well. Hope you have a great Easter if you're celebrating that. And we'll be back on Wednesday of next week, seven o'clock UK time, as always. So, for the meantime, from all of us here, bye for now.